Um, before we start, let's make our intention. Uh, why are we here? What are we going to be doing for the rest of this evening? What are we going to be doing for the rest of tomorrow morning and afternoon? Our intention here is to learn more about the life of our Habib Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the intention. Um, I was with a scholar, um, and, and, and one thing before I start, I highly recommend uh, the brothers to take notes. The brothers to take notes. The reason I encourage all of us to take notes is because Al-ilm sayyid wal kitabatu qayduhu Imam Shafi said that ilm is like hunted prey. It's like hunted prey. Knowledge, ilm, it's like hunted prey. And the way you capture it is by writing it down. A lot of us, we feel like we'll hear something and I'm just going to remember it and my life will change. I'll just change. Caterpillar to butterfly. I'll be a new person. The fact of it is, after this, these next four hours of studies and learning, uh, there will be moments where you have this, these thoughts. Write those down. Write those things that you hear. Write those things that you think while we're talking. Right? And come back to those notes. Review those notes. Look at them again. It's extremely important to capture uh, these moments. So with that, why are we here? What's the intention before we get started? The intention is to know our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam better. The intention here is to know this, our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a deeper, more personal way. When I say better, I, I want to be more clear what I mean by that. The objective for us is that he's not the prophet, he's your prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like your prophet is different than the prophet. The prophet means he's the prophet for the Muslims. Your prophet means there's a special connection. There's a special like connection that you have with him, right? And that, that comes over time, but it also comes with just studying his life. Sitting in these durus, learning about him, studying him, going deeper and deeper and deeper into his life, right? So that's our intention. We want to really, really focus on that love and muhabba. And here's the thing. A lot of y'all studied Sira since you were in like, like uh, you know, Sunday school. Eight years old, you know, Sister Amina was teaching you, right? In Sunday school, she went through the Sira and you connected with it, mashallah. So you'll, you'll listen with the intention of like, oh, I know that story. Oh, I know that story. Oh, I know that story. It's not about what stories you know. It's about how they relate to you differently in this phase of your life. See, see, okay. When you read about the Prophet Wasallam's relationship with Fatima, for example, Fatima was his last daughter, right? His last daughter is Fatima. She's the youngest. When you read about that relationship and you read how close they were, it's one thing. But when you have a daughter, how many brothers here have daughters? Right? Now, when you read that story as a father, when you read that story as a mother, it hits different. So I always say this, Sira doesn't change, but your life changes. And as your life changes, your connection and appreciation for different aspects of the Sira is what changes. And that's why scholars say, this is important, write this down. Scholars say you should do a khatam. You know how people do khatam of the Quran in Ramadan? They say every year you should do khatam of Sira. Like you read the whole Sira, I don't care which book. Yasser Qadi, he has a new book out, Revelation is there. There's tons of books, right? And maybe we can have a session where we just brainstorm different Sira books that are out there. Not the point, which one? The point is that every year of your life, you go back through the Sira. Why? Because it doesn't change, but you change. That's the key. It doesn't change, but you change. Sometimes we change in a positive way. Sometimes life circumstances change. Sometimes we've gotten worse in our Iman, and now when I come back, I can feel the difference. Like, wow, that story used to hit me. It's not hitting me anymore. What happened to my relationship? So again, we change for the better. We spiritually come to another place. Number two, our life circumstances change. So now that same story hits me so different. And number three, sometimes spiritually, I'm not where I was before, so the story doesn't hit me the same, but I'm able to test myself and where I'm at spiritually by how I connected to that story. So, I mean, Sira is a, is a bahar. It's an ocean. Um, I have the privilege and the great blessing from Allah, and I don't take it for granted, of teaching Sira at Qalam. And it takes, we go through it nine months. We're studying from all the books of Sira, 
just connecting and, and, and we spend nine months and five days a week, you know, 40 minute classes every single day going through Sira. We're going to be going over the Sira for the next, what, 12 hours or so, right? And so obviously all of the minute, smaller details, we won't be able to touch all of those, but of the bigger pictures, we'll be able to, to, to zoom in on those, connect to those, appreciate the significance of those in the Prophet Sallallahu life. So let's go through this. Why do we study Sira? Ready? Number one. The number one reason why, and this isn't in order of necessary importance. This is just the order I put, it's arbitrary. Number one reason is you cannot understand the book of Allah without understanding the context upon which and within which it was revealed. You can't understand Iqra. You can't understand ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forsaken you nor is he angry with you. You can't understand that truly and appreciate it until you connect it to the context of what it was revealed for. So the number one reason, number one reason that we study Sira is that without studying Sira, the Quran doesn't have that meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to gain from it. So by nature, I remember one time, and I shared this with some of the Shabab in Dallas, I remember one time, I read this verse, I was memorizing Quran, and uh, this was like, I had just become Muslim, you know, I'm surrounded by all these little kids rocking back and forth in a hips class, you know what I mean, y'all seen them before, you know, rocking, and I'm like this big dude sitting amongst them, 20 years old, you know, the old dude that doesn't fit in, mashallah, and, uh, and I read this verse from the end of Surah Shura, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِ مَا الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَارِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا And like thus we have sent down this ruh. The ruh here means the Qur'an. Because Qur'an is that soul food. I heard Munir talking about their soul food outside. What you know about soul food? <laughs> what you know about soul food in Cali? That's what I like. I'm just trolling. Y'all gonna have to get used to me. One thing I, I say is people have learned, forgot how to laugh and smile while we learn. People come into Jerusalem. You know, why not? Alhamdulillah. We are witnessing Allah's blessing. Allah chose us to spend the next like evening, a Friday, what's it, Friday? A Friday night studying the life of his Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Be happy. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And just smile. The smile has such a psychological impact. Just the physiological smile has such a psychological impact to your receptivity. I go on tangents, but sometimes they say tangents are good, okay? You know, we have a run club in Dallas, and I was talking about this this week, about smiling. And there's a study that shows, do we have any runners in the room? Runners? Okay, all right, whatever, well, one. He, he raised it light, too. He raised it right light. I noticed it, the immigrant community don't run. I started a run club. I started running in the run club. My wife was like, why? What, who runs? <laughs> Like, who runs, right? <laughs> so there's a study that shows you actually run better if you smile while you run. So what if we apply that to how we learn? What if we apply that to gatherings where we're trying to learn? So lighten up, smile, enjoy the moments while we're going through these things. Enjoy it. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to, subhanAllah, they say this is the, the Rasul, he used to sit with the Sahaba and they used to crack jokes about jahiliyyah. Everyone has a jahiliyyah, by the way. I don't care if you were born Aisha or Ahmed or Muhammad. Everybody has a jahiliyyah. And the Sahaba used to sit together and they would talk about jahiliyyah. Man, remember, we used to wild out. <laughs> like, man, we used to. And the Prophet Sallallahu would sit there and they say he would just smile. And we would be cracking up and he would just sit there and smile. So it's okay to smile while we learn. Um, I was saying, I ran to my teacher because this verse says, we sent down this, this ruh, this soul to you. And it refers to revelation. And Allah says, "Ma kunta tadri ma al-kitab wa al-iman." You did not know what the book was, nor did you know what faith was. When I read this verse, I'm like, "Wow, that that's me." I didn't know what the Quran was. I didn't know what iman was. I ran to my teacher, and I asked, "I asked, I said, Sheikh, when I read this verse, 
I feel like Allah's talking to me. Is it okay if I feel like it's, it's for me specifically? And I'm expecting him to be like, mashallah, yes. He's like, no. <laughs> no, bruh. It ain't about you, bruh. He said, no. Allah is speaking to his Habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then I asked him, I said, how do I connect to that? He said, no, you have to connect to his life. You have to understand first it was revealed on him. You have to understand the context in which it was revealed on him. What was happening in his life? And as we study his life starting today, we're going to see so many things that you're going to look back and be like, man, I, I was going through that. I was going through that. I was going through that. And once you connect to his life, then you're able to embody the meaning of those verses. So number one reason why we study the seerah, the life of the, the, life, the, the life of the Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to have a deeper, deeper appreciation for uh, an understanding of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, second reason, tahqiq wa shahadat bi risalati, to develop true belief in him as a prophet, in him as a prophet. There's two things I say, you're playing yourself short if you haven't done it. If you're above the age of 17 and you haven't, number one, read the entire Quran in your mother tongue, you're playing yourself short. And number two, age of 17, you haven't heard the entire life of the Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Two things, by the age of 17, and I say 17, because 16, you wilding out, 15. I was going to even say 18, but I'll put that 17. Whole Quran. How many people in this room have done khatam of the Quran in Arabic? A number of times. Don't raise your hands. Okay. Uh, okay. How many of us have done khatam in a language we understand? Yo, if you get a letter from someone you love, right, Amen? <laughs> if you get a letter from somebody you love, you read that letter. Habibi knows. What's your name? What's your name? Ali. Ali. I'm going to be picking on you today, yo. Because he felt that. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Stuff for a love. <laughs> if you get a letter from someone you love, you read that letter back, forth, front. You look, flip it over. Is it coded? Is she, it, are they trying to tell me something else? What about this, this message from Allah? What about this message from Allah? Allah loves you. And I want you to whisper to yourself. I want you to say in your heart, Allah loves me. I want you to say that. I'm, I'm not, this is not rhetorical. Within yourself, close your eyes and say, Allah loves me. Allah loves me. How many of us have been taught Allah is angry with us? And we're walking around every day waiting for the adab, waiting for the adab. Yeah, my boss is going to fire me any moment now. I'm a bad Muslim. I'm a bad person. Allah loves me. Say, Allah loves me. He wrote, he, he sent you this revelation as a guidance for you. And here you are at the age of 25, 24, 35, 40, but you've never read this letter, this, you get the context, letter that has been written for you to show his love to you in a language that you understand. And number two, and number two, number two, what we're doing now going over the entire life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just for factual data, but to grow to love him more. So number two reason we study the seerah is to affirm tahqiq al-risalatihi, tahqiq al-risalat in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to truly, truly believe in the, in the, in the risala. Like when I say, ashhadu anna Muhammad and abduhu wa rasulu, oh, I'm saying that from my heart. Not because my daddy said it, not because my mom said it, not because the community, because I saw his life and I saw the, I saw the signs of Nubuwa. Number, number three, number three, a deep study of the seerah, an in-depth study of the seerah will do this, number three, remove doubts that surround the seerah. Doubts, we have haters, y'all. We have haters, if you live on social media, then you got all types of doubts floating in your head about the seerah. Until you study it. Until you study it. From people who love the Rasul. From people who love the Rasul. You won't be able to remove those doubts. You won't be able to remove them. Number four. And I said these are not in order of importance. 
التمكين لمحبته في قلب to solidify love of him in your heart love 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 is powerful and a lot of us have a very cerebral relationship with with our our nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam it has to be love love conquers everything love is powerful love is what pushes sahaba to to stand in front of arrows coming at him when your motor reflexes tell you to flee love is what puts you in front of your child to save their life love of the rasul alayhi salatu wasalam that right there is the next thing that we strive for and i want to tell you something about love al hub shifa li man yuhib wa yuhab hub is a is a is a cure for the lover and the one being loved when i show love to qasim my son he's eight that's that's curing sicknesses in my heart that's curing me but it's also curing him he's going to grow up inshallah sanjul he's going to grow up feeling loved feeling appreciated feeling my baba was always there for him hub hub for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and 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 they and as the shuyukh said how can you love that which you don't know how can you love that which you don't know am lam ya'rifu rasuluhum fa hum lahu munkir or do they not know their prophet therefore they're rejecting so the what number was that i'm a, ali i'm going to keep calling you out number 4 right number 4 reason number 5 The scholars say that the the ummah in the latter days will only be saved by what saved them in the first days. The salah the salah salah of the ummah today will be gained or the well-being of our ummah today, healing of our ummah collectively happens by the same means that happened in the first generation. So the sahaba say, listen to this. We used to study the maghazi the way y'all teach surahs to your children. Let me explain what that means. The the sahaba the tabi'in they used to say our parents they used to teach us the seer the life of the prophet the way you teach the small surahs to your children. You sit there in al-qariya 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 like we do that. That's how they used to teach seerah. Not, not in the formal way, but the idea was it was something that was going on in the house. That's why scholars say, and this is advice to the mothers and the older brothers in the room and the older sisters in the room, please establish this. And they're gonna be like, "Oh, you went to the seerah, of course. That's why you're saying it. It's okay. <laughs> establish this. Establish a regular reading in the family of a book of seerah." At first they're going to be like, "Oh, mom, this is corny. This is my my daughter Maria, she's at the age she's 10, so everything is not cool enough. How did we get here?" Anyways, um I used to be the coolest guy now I'm lame. You know what I mean, Ali? You got kids? Are you married? Oh, mashallah, Ali is not married, y'all. <laughs> And he's reading letters. Stop for Allah. <laughs> nah, no, mashallah. No, so Ali, Ali, write this down. Future, when you're looking through those applications, you know, those rishtas, just ask, are you are you okay with us reading Sira? Nightly reading, ten minutes, ten minutes. We read one thing, and we all ref- we just read it quick. Just read it regular. You know what? You may start it, and and the people in the family they just walk past you like, oh, you're doing that again. Before you know it, they're gonna start sitting down. Read it out loud. and start reading it. So the way we cure the 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 illnesses of the heart are the of the later times are by using the methods that they used in the early times. And one of those methods was a constant reading of the life of the Rasul alayhi salatu wassalam. Tayyib. How many you got, Ali? Tayyib, kafi. I think these are enough for us inshallah ta'ala uh to begin inshallah So let's get right into it inshallah. I mean, may Allah allow us to gain insight this evening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this moment to renew and and rejuvenate our iman. Uh may Allah allow this to be a moment of uh, closeness with him. I'll share one hadith and then I'll start. 
One day the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with the Sahaba and he said, I wish I could see my brothers. Some of y'all know this hadith, it's my favorite. I wish I could see my brothers. The Sahaba were sitting there and they're like, we're here, Ya Rasulullah. And the Rasul Sallallahu said, no, no, you're my Sahaba. I wish I could see my brothers. They said, who are your brothers? He said, there'll be people that come after me that haven't seen me, but they would give anything to see me. They believe in me, they haven't seen me, they would give anything to see me. They would give anything. Those are my brothers and my sisters. That's us, inshallah. Before I go forward, some of us, shaitan is saying to you, you're not pious, why are you pretending? Why are you sitting in this gathering? This man's talking about love. Look at all these pious people. You feel like a fake. I feel like a fake sitting here too. But you know what? It's not about me. The Prophet ﷺ said, Shafa'ati li ahli al-kaba'ir min ummati. My intercession is for the people of major sins of my own. The major sins. The ones that feel like they, don't, they shouldn't be here. The ones that their boy just brought him in, like, yo, bro, just pull up. Just pull up. And you're like, man, y'all too pious for me over there. The fact that Allah brought you in this gathering means Allah loves you. Not because I'm here. If I wasn't here, anybody, someone else would be here. But Allah chose us to sit here in this moment and study his habib and get closer to him. Just say alhamdulillah. Just say alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So let's get right into it, inshallah, because it is a short, uh, it is a short session, meaning short in, in, in that we don't have months to go over the, the content. So it is, it is somewhat short. So I'm going to start. Uh, we just did some of the reasons why it's important to study sirah. Um, the next thing I'm going to go into is the, the birth of the Rasul, alayhi salatu was salam. And let me... Pull open my notes, inshallah. Oh, we got, oh, I want to look at this real quick. Let's take a look at this. Um, you have this in your email, by the way. If this is too hard to see and you signed up for the course, you should have this PowerPoint in your email. So the way um, this is broken down is very beautiful. It helps you really uh, break down the sirah. On the inner circle, you'll see the year. The entire mission of the Prophet, وسلم, as we know, is only 23 years. Now, what I want you to understand is in the course of 23 years, the transformation that he caused in the hearts of people is phenomenal. Just to think a reformation of that caliber happened in only 23 years is, is, is mind blowing. The first 12 and a half years are in blue. Those are what we call the Meccan phase. The Meccan phase because the Prophet Sallallahu was in Mecca in those days. Now, the Meccan phase is drastically different than the Medina phase. How so? Let's have a little dialogue, okay? I, I thrive on dialogue. I'm like one of those black preachers from the South. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. I need like something. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, how is Mecca different than Medina? Just brief. No, oh, but when I ask for questions, don't give a, a lecture. Please, and I'm saying with all due respect, I know we all have great thoughts, but just to respect other people's time. Mecca was about Tawheed and uh, afterlife, and Medina was about humility and Tawheed. Yeah. Like yeah, I love that what she said, and I want you to write that down. Mecca was building the foundation of faith. Medina was building up. You know, you build a house, you got to dig down first. And the better the foundation, the bigger the edifice on top of it can be. And I'll share a hadith with you that's in Bukhari. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, and if I go a little fast, just bear with me because of time. Uh, if we had weeks together, inshallah Munir, we'll put it together, we'll do some stuff. Uh, if we had more time together, I would take my time more, but I want to cover more. Um, this hadith in Bukhari is profound. Aisha says in Bukhari, she says that the first thing to be revealed upon us were the small surahs that talked about heaven, hell, and the akhirah. She says, until faith was strong in the hearts of people, and then the halal and the haram came down. She says, these are her words, not mine. If the first thing to come down was halal and haram, 
her words. She says, if the first thing to be revealed was la tashribu al-khamar, the people would have said, we'll never give up alcohol. She says, if the first thing to be revealed was don't commit zina, the people would have never committed zina, uh, never stopped. She says, but it came after the foundation was established. Another reason, Ali, put this in your notes. Another reason we, it's my guy. Another reason we study Sira is to learn the proper method of Dawah. Listen, if somebody takes Shahada tomorrow and you pull them to, to the side and start teaching them Makharij, Kha, Ain, Wa, Wa, bro, you have missed the point. Like, I just took Shahada. I believe in one Allah and I want to believe more. And you're like, let me give you a linguistics lesson. Really? No. The beginning years, the beginning years were not about halal and haram. Now, I want you to take a moment and think, how does that bit of knowledge impact you as a parent or an older brother or older sibling? Non-rhetorical question. How does that bit of knowledge, does anyone get any insight? Like, ah, okay. How many of us when we started teaching our children, we just started with do's and don'ts. Namaz bro. Namaz, salli, salli. Oh, put your hijab on. Now it's time, put your hijab. Any love of the Prophet? No. Any love of Akhirah? No. Any, any thought of Qiyamah? Do you know Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, he says, I was a little kid in Fez. And I was going to the makatib, like the, the, the teachers for Quran. And at lunchtime, we used to go home for lunch. And she, he says, my grandmother, he said, my grandmother taught me imam. He says, I would come home and I, I, I would say to grandma, grandma, can I have food, lunch? And she would say, Mindi ta'al nad'ullah. She would say, I don't have food, let's go make dua for it. He says, I'm six, seven years old. So we would go pray to Raka'ah and she would make dua with me. And then she would, after we made dua, she would say, let's go look around the house. But she already hid the food somewhere. <laughs> and the little boy, seven years old, he just made dua. He would run around, the, it's in a different place every time. He would run, oh, and she would say, he would go to eat and she would say, La, we have to show gratitude first. Hakada. Aisha radiallahu anha is telling us the Meccan phase here tells us. Can you see my mouse too? Okay. The Meccan phase here is all about hardship, grinding, iman. How many prayers are there in the most of the Meccan phase? Up until year 11. When does the five prayers come? For those who know, let's teach those who don't. 11. Right here in 11th year, Isra and Mi'raj, right? So prior to that, how many prayers a day? Two. Two. Morning and evening, that's it. No jama'ah, don't got to go to the masjid, you can't go to the masjid. It's, it's, there's war out there. The, you walk out the house, it's like UK right now. <laughs> may Allah make it easy, may Allah make it easy. I wasn't meant to really be a joke, but yeah, because may Allah make it easy. Maybe that was a really bad joke, actually. Um, no, so, so look, in the 11th year, in the 11th year, the five prayers come. How close is the 11th year to the, Me to the Medini phase? It's right there. So that means there's no zakat. There's no hajj. There's two prayers a day. What are we doing? We're building iman. We're building iman. And the surahs are all the small surahs. I do air quotes because scholars don't like when you call them small. Because zilzal is like heavy. Qari'a is heavy. Like these small surahs, if you read them, you're like, that's deep. But they were building iman first. Right? So how did, so, so Sidi Ahmed Zarruq is saying that my grandmother was teaching me iman from the age of six. And here we are at the age of seven. When's the last time you talk to your sibling? And I'm saying sibling because our older siblings have so much influence on who we are. And unfortunately, older brothers just troll younger brothers. 
<laughs> That's all they do. Older sisters are a little better. You know what I mean? But older brothers, older sisters, I had older sisters, not there. Let me change that. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you can teach a child Iman. You can teach them when they're impressionable and they look up to you and you're like Superman to them and you're like, let's make dua. Let's make dua. Subhanallah. So what I'm trying to highlight here is, Ali, I was saying there was another reason we study sirah. Did you get what it was? To learn the proper method of giving dawah and growing someone, tarbiyah. When we say tarbiyah, that means how to raise someone up as a good Muslim. And you don't got to be perfect to help raise someone to be good. I'm going to say that again. We always working on ourselves until the day we breathe our last breath. If you wait till you become good to help other people become good, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. But everyone in this room has something they could teach another person. You know why converts go so high in their faith? Because everyone around them, they see them as a teacher. They'll walk up to the young dude who's like 13, 12 years old and be like, can you teach me tayyatu lila wa salawat? Little dude's like, <clears throat> yes, come here. <laughs> the dude says he's fixing his tajweed and stuff. So what I'm trying to explain to us is when we learn, we look at sirah, we get the proper method of raising someone up. If a family member of yours becomes Muslim or your neighbor becomes Muslim and somebody comes over and they're like, you know, there's like 12 rakah for Thor, right? <laughs> Habibi, there's four for this new Muslim. When they get to the Sunnah and the Nawafid, we get that, we got it. But right now there's four for them. Build them up. So what I was trying to highlight here is we get a proper method of how to give dawah and how faith should be grown in a person and, be, and, and built up. Does that make sense? Allah give us tawfiq, mashallah. Okay, so um, I want to start off. Let's go to this next. So again, if we look at this, this map starts from, if you, this, this thing on your screen starts from Nubuwa, when prophecy began. Our whole dars today will end at number one. So Mufti Abdul Wahab, who comes tomorrow, I won't be here tomorrow. Mufti Abdul Wahab is going to start from there and go towards the end. I'm going leading up to Nubuwa, inshallah ta'ala. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so the first thing we're going to cover is the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the childhood of the... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's, it's just responding really differently. What's going on? Okay. It's going forward. I'm pressing both buttons and it's going forward. Oh, I could just use this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the, the, the birth of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the childhood of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, I went too far? Okay. We're good, don't worry, I got y'all. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Tayyib. So we begin the, the life of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with, uh, we'll begin at this point, which is Amina, pregnant with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amina, the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, while she was still pregnant with the Rasul Sallallahu his father passed away. His father had went on a journey, um, and he passed on his way back from the journey. He got sick, and he passed away. Um, and so uh, Amina uh, has to think about raising this child on her own. Um, I particularly connect to that because my mother was a single mother raising me, right? And so when I look at Amina, I see my mother. I see that same struggle of a single mother trying to raise a child. Um, there are many narrations that talk about signs that Amina saw. Some of the signs, she says that um, I, I didn't even know I was pregnant until I noticed that, uh, that I, my, my menstrual cycle didn't continue. And she says that I didn't feel the burden of pregnancy with this child. And now you may say, okay, what's the connection there? He's rahmatul lil alameen. A mercy for humanity. 
So the scholars say that Allah didn't even allow him to give taklif or hardship to his own mother. Do you get it? Right? He was a mercy for everyone. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was, was born in the valley of Banu Hashim in Mecca. Banu Hashim, their tribe, lived in this cul-de-sac of a valley. That becomes the same valley that they're boycotted in later. Um, he was born in a house. The house, they said, was Dar ibn Yusuf was the name of the house. And most of the narrations say that he was born on the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal. There's difference of opinion on a lot of things. I'll stick with the most authentic or the most agreed upon opinions with everything. He was born in the year of the elephant. Now, this is big. And the reason this is big is because I won't go into the incident of Abraha and the Fiyat, but the reason why this is important is because it was a moment that marked history. And, and prior to that, they did not keep good records of what year you were born. And so the scholars say the significance of him being born in that year is that it's a year everyone remembered. So everyone looks back and it's like, what year was he born? Ahmed Fil. everyone's like, oh. For many of us, it's like September 11, right? Everyone remembers what happened September 11th. It's just etched in our head, right? And so, so he was born in the year of the elephant. Um, there are different narrations about the birth of the Prophet Wasallam and the miraculous uh, nature of it. Uh, his mother narrates that when she gave birth to him, she didn't feel any pain whatsoever. She also narrates that she saw lights come out of her womb and she saw clarity to the palaces of Syria. She says this is what she saw giving birth to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and some narrations even narrate that when he was born, that he came out clean. She says that um, one of the other women that was helping give birth to him, she says that I was in the, in the room and all I remember was light in that room that day. Um, she says, I remember just seeing immense light in, in, in the room. Um, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, um, his grandfather was extremely elated, uh, extremely elated that this grandson, because Abdullah was his favorite son, he had a special affinity with him. So many of us, when you lose someone, there's never a replacement, right? But we understand how younger children can sometimes take a place in the heart after losing someone. It seems as if this child, without a name yet, that, that his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, he saw this child as my Abdullah who's gone now. This is, this is him, this is through him. The narration says when he was born, they brought him, they, they, they covered the baby up and they brought him to his grandfather. And uh, when they brought him to him, he, he held him. He kissed him and he hugged him and he, he gave the order. He said that I, I want this child to always be remembered and I want him to always be praised. So I want you to, to name him Muhammad, right? And that name had never been used before. It was a name that was very different. They had never heard that, that name. And they asked him, uh, it was the day, the seventh day of his, after his birth, they did his circumcision which was the Arabs had done that at that time. Uh, and they slaughtered a goat and they had a feast. And the Arabs never used this name and they were caught off guard. So they asked Abdul Muttalib, Lima raghibta bihi an asma'i ahli bayti? Why did you use strange names for him? And he said, Aratu an yuhmadahu Allah ta'ala fi sama wa khalqahu fil ard. I want him to be loved by God and praised by people on earth. So I gave him the name uh, Muhammad. There are other narrations that say that Abdul Muttalib saw a dream in which he was told to give him this name. Nonetheless, he was given this name that was very different at the time. The, the Prophet وسلم, after a few days, uh, it came time for him to be nursed and suckled. Uh, as many of us know this story, um, he, the, the custom of the Arabs were that 
they would send the child out into the desert with a tribe for the child to be out of the city and the hustle and bustle of the city and the, the germs of the city so the child could grow up in the desert, free from all of the influences. They also did it because the tribes around, they spoke clear Arabic, good Arabic, not mixed in with the metropolitan life. So the child would grow up. And it's a beautiful story. I think it's worth reading in detail. Typically, the tribes from the outskirts, they would come to Mecca in order to take a child because they understood they would get some payment for taking care of a child. And so Banu Sa'ad was the tribe that was blessed with the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi They come and the, uh, the narration is told best by Halima herself. So I'll read what she says about this moment. She says, uh, we all went to Mecca in order to find a child. She said, I went with my husband and we had one baby already. Obviously, in order to be a wet nurse, you have to have a child already. So she says, I have a child. But she says, it was hard days. We were in the tough time of our life, the grinding period, the one bedroom apartment days, the hard days. But we said, you know, I'll go there and I'll get a child and we'll make some money and we'll, we'll get some, it'll help us. She says, I came on a mule that was really weak and we had a camel that we would try to get meat, uh, uh, milk from, but it didn't even give a drop of milk. She says that on the nights we were going, my child would try to drink milk from me, but he would not get any milk. So my child would often cry itself to sleep. And she used to say, we were, we were hopeful though. We had hope in Allah. We had hope that things would get better. She said, finally, we reached Mecca. And um, she says, that every single woman in my group was presented Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But no one accepted him. I want to pause here. Have you ever felt that people don't recognize your worth or value? Have you ever felt underappreciated? That people just overlook you. They don't realize your potential. Everyone in this room has had those moments. I've had those moments. Right now, I connect to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone looked over him. What is this child? They would look at him. Then they would see the grandfather and the, and the mother. And then they would say, wait, where's the father? They would say, the father's passed away. They would keep it moving. How many of us in this room have been overlooked before? By people close to us. They couldn't see our value. Your Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was overlooked time after time after time. Every person walked past, walked past. People not valuing you doesn't speak to the value you actually have within you. You can't see, see, if you, if you take a Hafiz of Quran who memorized the book of Allah, and, to, and, and take this person in front of a group of people that don't value the Quran at all. Will they see any value in this half of the Quran? No. That same person will walk in this room and we will make, split the rows for that person. Sharrafna bi huduri. Please lead us in salah. Subhanallah. Why? Because we see value. Our eyes see that value. We have to stop letting people and their inability to see what their value in us Stop letting this make us feel less. Them walking past the Rasul Sallallahu did not, it was their, only their inability to see who he, who he was and the potential. She says that everyone was presented him and they would all say, oh, he's a yatim, he's an orphan. Yeah, what could the family do? They probably won't be able to give us a lot of money. Every woman finally, by the end of the day, every woman in my group had a baby. They all got these new babies that they're gonna take back. And I went back to my husband and I said, I don't have a child, which tells me something too. In that moment, she felt like she was missing out, but Allah was saving something better for her. Think about your life now. She felt like everyone's got something and I don't. 
when the big plan, we're here 1,400 years later, like, yo, hold up, just hold up. Yo, just hold up. You wait till you see what Allah has for you. How many of us in this room, we're looking around, my man got married already, my man got a gig already, my, she, she already got a, a rishta, she already got a thing. And we're like, and, and, and I'm just like, how do you know this ain't your Halima moment? How do you know this isn't your Halima moment? Can you just wait a little bit? Can you just wait? So she says, I went back to my husband. And I was like, I can't go back empty handed. She says, I said to my husband, Wallahi la adhabanna ila dharik al yatim, fala akhudannahu. She goes, I'm just going to go get the orphan. I'm going to go get the orphan. And she says, he, he said, La alayka anta fali. He said, Alright, bismillah. Supportive husband. I got your back, Habibti, whatever you choose. He was a supportive husband. He was like, I got you, whatever you want to do. And then he says, maybe Allah will put barakah in him for us. Listen, your words matter. Your words matter. Sometimes parents say stuff about their children in a moment, and I'm cringing like, please stop. Words matter. Words, speak positive things. A lot of times you're frustrated with your son, and you say things like, you know, well, you, you're not going to become anything. Stop. Speak good. There's a hadith that says many times calamities come based on the words we say. Based on the words we say. And here your son is grinding, grinding, grinding. Well, you kept throwing bad duas at the man when he was growing up. Speak positive. So he says... Perhaps Allah will place barakah in him for us. She says, I went, I took him. She goes, the only reason why I took him was I didn't want to have nothing. Which means sometimes your intention too may not be the highest. Her intention wasn't, oh, I'm going to take this kid. It will be a blessing. Her intention is, I don't want to look bad. I'm just going to take this kid. Despite that intention, Allah's like, I'm going to give you something through this. I'm going to give you something through this. She says, um, I took him. And she says, uh, the moment I placed him in my lap and he came close to my chest to suck, she said, I felt milk in my chest. And he began to drink. And she's, she's thinking, what's going on? And then he drank until he was satiated. And then I picked up his brother now, meaning her original child, and she brought him to the other side of her chest and she suckled him. The scholars say that the prophet would only suckle from one side because he never wanted to do, because Allah never wanted him to do injustice to someone else and not do injustice to this little baby. So as a baby, his inclination was to one side, he would never rush me from the other side because that's someone else's haq. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. She says, he drank till he was full. His brother drank. They both went to sleep. She says, we didn't sleep before that. My husband got up and he went over to the camel that we used to get milk from. And he's milking and milk's coming out. She goes, he, he filled up a, a bowl and we drank. We drank milk until we were full. She says, Fabitna bi khayri layla. We had the best night that night. Best night. She says, when I came, the mule I was on was the slowest one. And my whole crew was like, can you speed up? You know when you drive in that hoopty, what do y'all call them these days? I don't know. That beat up car, the one that you always say the dua before you start. <laughs> yeah, we got those cars now, y'all forget the duas. You just press the button. Y'all don't even be pressing buttons no more. Just get in. But back in the day, you had the joint. You always read the dua. Every dua, too. Subhanallah. Sakharana hada. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. You probably read Fatiha, too, on that car. And then you started it. She said, that's how my ride was before I went. She said, as we went back, this mule is in front of everyone. And everyone's like, Ya Halima. Did you switch mules? She goes, no, it's the same one. They say, something's up. Halima describes the next two years as filled with barakah. 
blessing after blessing after blessing. Our, our, our sheep would go out. They would come back full. The neighbor's sheep, the, the, the neighbors would tell the shepherds, please graze wherever Halim is grazing. <laughs> Baraka. So what's the lesson for me and you? You're listening. Okay, what's the lesson? The scholars, they say, when you bring the sunnah in your life, you will see a barakah. You will see a barakah. It may not at first look like it, you'll see a barakah. What is barakah? A lot of us think barakah means more. It means more with less. Man, the way I saw my mother stretch $5, y'all. Baraka. Baraka. We were driving past a billboard yesterday, and it was a billboard for a sandwich for $5. And my wife, she's, she's young. She got an old soul, right? She said, $5? <laughs> she said, you know how many sandwiches I can make with $5? I leaned over. I was like, PBJ, right? Peanut butter and jelly. She's like, no, nah, I can make turkey. She said, I can make a bunch of turkey sandwiches with $5. Baraka is not that you get a better job. Barakah is with the salary you have, you will see more in it. That's it, there you, thank you, Habib. <laughs> That's my ace right there, mashallah. It's gonna be a beautiful night, Allah. Sallallahu ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So she says, we continue to see this barakah. We continue to see these blessings. She kept him for two years. When the two years were over, he, he, he aged, he grew faster. She says that he, when he was two, he looked like he was three and a half-ish. He grew faster. Um, and he would play with the children. And as I said, she says that he would only drink from one side of her chest, not the other side. And the scholars say that that's because adal and justice was ingrained upon his soul. Ingrained upon his soul. Um, so it came time to return him. Oh, I'm sorry. When Abdul Muttalib found out who took him, or when he was, he asked her her name. She said, Halima. He said, what tribe are you from? She said, Banu Sa'ad. And he said, Bakh, Bakh. They like, they said, Wah, Wah. Right, he said, Oof, Oof. He said, Sa'dun wa Hilmun. What does this mean? Let me break it down. Words have an impact. He, the name of the tribe was Sa'ad. Sa'ad means felicity, goodness. And Halima comes from Hilm, forbearance. So he heard her name, Halima, and he saw good. He heard the tribe's name, and he saw good. I, I say this because later in the Prophet, so I said, we see the same thing. I won't digress too much for the sake of time. There was a moment where he was being attacked by a group during Hijrah. And the man attacking him with an entourage of 70 people, his name was Bureida. So there's 70 people in front of the Prophet trying to capture him. The Prophet looks at the, the leader of the, of, the, of, the, of the gang. He says, what's your name? The man says, Bureida. Now, Bureida is from Barad, which means cold in Arabic. But Bureida means like a little chill. His name was Lil Chill. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. So the Prophet, so I said, when he said Bureida, he looked at Abu Bakr and he said, Barad Allahu Amarana. Our situation has cooled down. <laughs> Is it? But that's brilliant. He takes any small sign of goodness as a good omen. So many of us, we are waiting for Allah's punishment. He would meet somebody. What's your name? Abdul Fattah. Alhamdulillah. Allah's about to make openings for me. Alhamdulillah. He would look for goodness. Then he asked him, he said, uh, what's, what tribe are you from? And he said, Banu uh, Salma. He goes, Salamna. He looked at Abu Bakr. He goes, Salamna. We made it. We made it. And if you're Abu Bakr and there's 70 people in front of you, and you just take the name, it's kind of like. But this was the Sunnah. He looked for every opportunity. So Abdul Muttalib, when he heard the name, he said, Sa'dun wa Hilmun. Forbearance and goodness. Oh, this is the proper place for our boy to be raised. When, the, when, 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 when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he, was, when he was two years old and he was weaned, it was time to bring him back. 
Halima was seeing a lot of barakah. So she comes back to Amin and she goes, ah, I don't think he's ready for city life yet. <laughs> the same people that overlook you one day, when you glow up, when you glow up, they'll want more time with you. They'll want more time with you. That's the sunnah. The more you get involved in the sunnah of the Prophet, small sunnahs, sit down when you drink, you know, small sunnahs, the more you love him. So she goes, he has to stay. Is it time for mother? He has to stay with us. He has to stay with us. He told me four. Four minutes? Hello, I love. Right after mother, we come back to continue this journey, y'all. She goes, um, I'm worried about him. Halima goes, I'm worried about him. He's not ready for city life. He'll get sick. And Amina, now it is a different time. So for many of us, there's a really disconnect here because how could you be away from your child for that time, right? But this was the orf or the norm of their time. So they were used to this, very common. So Amina goes, you know, it looks like you want him to just stay with you. And she goes, yeah, you know, we want him to stay. It's better for him. So Amina gives permission. Okay, let him stay with you. It'll be better for his Arabic. It'll be better for raising him up. Take care of him. And so he goes back until in the fourth year, in the fourth year, one day, and we'll end after this. One day the Prophet ﷺ was playing in, his, in the backyard, you could say, with his brothers. He's about four years old. And the Prophet ﷺ is a, is a, is a, is a, is a six, I'm sorry, thank you. He's six years old. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he's a child. So when he explains it, he says, I was playing in the backyard. And all of a sudden, I saw two people in full white, full white. And they came up to me. And the narration is beautiful. The narration says that they came over to him. And these two angels, as we know them now, they come over and they look at each other and they say, Ahu Ahu, is he him? Is he him? And the other angel goes, Hua Hua, he's him. Yeah, yeah, laughing. <laughs> Those laughing, it's, they use that slang these days. He's him. This is what the hadith says. Ahua hua, is he him? The angel goes hua hua, and the angel goes, young boy, be calm. You don't know what Allah has in store, great for you. And they lay him down, and they perform the first open heart surgery on this boy. They split open his chest. She. That the Prophet says they brought something that looked like ice and, and, and water. And they cooled my chest and they washed my heart. The scholars, they said they were washing his heart from some of the lower inclinations of humans. They were cleaning him, getting him ready to be ready what's going to come later. See, it's not going to happen once. It's going to happen multiple times. His brother runs off and he runs to his, father, his mother and he says, Muhammad's dead. That's what he says. He says, someone killed Muhammad. Now for Halima, this, is, this boy is my aman. So she runs and when she comes back, she sees the, the prophet, six-year-old boy, standing up, faces flushed. And she says, what happened? What happened? And he says, I don't know. They, they laid me down and they were looking for something inside of me. And he's six. He's explaining it as a six-year-old would. And they, they did something and then they covered it back up and they said some words to me. I don't understand what they were trying to say to me. Halima, she goes to her husband. She tells him, he says, we going back to Mecca. Runs back to Amina. Uh, yeah, it's ready for him to come back to y'all. <laughs> you know, when you was a kid and you broke something and you just put it back just enough <laughs> so that the next person could touch it and be like, ooh, what you do? <laughs> I know, we all did the same thing. So Halima, Ali, uh, uh, Amina notices, whoa, just five months ago, you, you know, two years ago, you wanted this boy so much. Why are you just trying to give him to me? And she goes, no, no, no. She tries to play it off for a few minutes. And Amina's like, tell me the truth. And she's like, I'm worried for him. And Amina goes, okay, he can stay with me, but I'll tell you, there's nothing to worry about this boy. I've seen things from him when I gave birth to him. I know something special is going to happen with this boy. 
And so this is how the Prophet ﷺ returned back to his mother. We'll pick up from here after Maghrib, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum. So um, just to catch up, if we look at the slides, we can't, we went over uh, some of this material. Bismillah. Testing. This one's on too. Okay. Um, so, mashallah, we went over the miracles at the birth of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We went over, you know, Abu Lahab and how happy he was and how he knew how special he was. And then we went over the aspects of uh, Halima Sa'diya and we talked about the importance of not attaching your value to uh, other people's perception of you. Um, sometimes people can't understand uh, something's value because they're not looking at it the right way. Similarly with us in our lives, sometimes people don't realize our value. And I think there's another side of that coin as well, which is sometimes we don't see the value because we're not looking from the right perspective. Even our own sons, our own daughters, our own family members, we don't value them as we should value them. Um, and then we moved on to, there were some other people who were uh, wet nurses of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We won't go into all of those, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and then we talked about this. Um, that there were four times throughout the life of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which his, uh, there was shaq sadr or the washing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's heart. Um, and they say that the wisdom of each of these brothers and sisters was to prepare him for what was on the, in the next, what was coming, and to get him ready. And so this happened four times. The final time right before the Isra and Mi'raj or the night journey uh, to prepare him for that. The third time right before Revelation. Um, and then the second time during childhood as well. Okay, um, so before we go forward, here on our slide is the, the uh, when, he, when the Prophet ﷺ gets married to Khadija anha. Before that, I want to talk about something else, however. Um, one of the beautiful things about Islam and about our connection with the Rasul ﷺ is that we have so much detail in, of his life. If you take the life of Isa, the entire deen of Christianity. The whole thing is based on his birth and six or seven months after he came back from Egypt until he was resurrected, or what their side of the story is, right? What's amazing is when you look at the amount of detail that we have on his entire life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the moment he was born, the details, the, the childhood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the years before prophethood, it, if you compare it collectively, the entire Bible only covers two years and tarikh, history only covers two years of the life of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, when we have years and years and years of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasalam sunnah. I say that because there's this, uh, back in the day there used to be this, uh, this bracelet that people used to wear, what would Jesus do? You don't know what he would do. You ain't got enough information to know what he would, you could guess. But for real, if you ask someone, what would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do at the loss of a son? What would, what would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do at, the, at a difficult moment? What would he do in battle? What would he do upon having a child? What would he do upon waking up? What would he do when he go to sleep? Do you want me to keep going? So when you ask the question, what would he do? The seerah has answers for that. Where other traditions despite how confident they may be in their uh, 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 profession of faith, they have so little compared to what we have in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I like that sweatshirt, bro. Ali, I might pick on somebody else now, bro. <laughs> so I want to talk about the years that led up to the marriage with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. We have to understand, when we go back at that first, um, I'm going to go back a few slides. I want to go all the way back to that first slide. This one right here, this one right here. If we looked at this slide right here, this was really profound because what we said was this entire blue phase was preparation for the ibadah, for the actions, as the sister said, building community. All of those aspects came later. And everything in this blue phase was preparing, building that foundation of faith so that when the order for don't drink khamer came, it was flowing in the streets. Faith was built. But what's interesting is what we're covering was everything that Allah put the Prophet ﷺ through in order to prepare him 
for revelation. So what do we have? The first thing, the loss of his mother. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was being nurtured by his mother until he reached the age of seven. His mother took him to Yathrib, Medina, in order to see her in-laws, her family. They went there and the Prophet, remember, he remembers it very clear. He says, I learned how to swim in the wells of Medina. So he remembers when he was a kid that his summer trip to Medina, that's where I learned how to swim. So he remembers, he's old enough to remember this. And he's there for some time and he's with Banu Najjar. That's his family, which now makes so much sense when he comes back to Medina and he says, let the camel go and the camel lands in Banu Najjar. He was supposed to be there anyway because that was his family, those were his people. But if he had chosen them, then everyone else in Medina would have felt some kind of way. You know, I'm talking to Ali, brothers in the back, salty right now. <laughs> you know, they're like, yo, what's up with Ali? Why is Ali getting all the attention? Right? Because I don't have the emotional intelligence of the Prophet There's a good book on EQ of the Prophet by the way. Shameless plug. Okay. No one got it. It's okay. All right. No, the Rasul said when he arrived in Medina, he said, let the camel go for innaha ma'mura. It's going on its, its order to go where it will go. Why did he say that? One of the beautiful wisdoms is Medina was filled with so much beef that if he had chose one over the other, it would have caused more beef. So he said, let it go. And where did it end? It ended up right where he had visited when he was a child at seven years old, when his mother brought him. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes to visit with his mother. Family trip with mom, road trip to Medina. And Ummi Ayman was with them. Who's Ummi Ayman? A black woman. Yes. Who he used to call my mother after my mother. Ummi Ayman at this time was maybe 14-ish. She lives the entire life of the Prophet وسلم, and she lives after him too. And he calls her my mother. And why did I say a black woman? Because when you think of the woman he called mom, many of us don't get a picture of that. Right? That's beautiful. The amount of colorism in our communities. Yes, that's deep. And that's heavy and it carries profound meaning. May I go on this tangent for a minute? We should respect Africa, man. Because it was the first place that welcomed Islam. It was the first place. Now, I love my, my, my Desi and Arab brothers and sisters. TK, some kush TK. TK. <laughs> but Islam was in Africa a long time before. And flourishing. I say that because it's important to recognize, recognize like our tradition and the places that were honored with Islam in the early days. Don't sleep on that. So Ummi Ayman was there. She was like a servant. She, you know, used to take care of Amina, do little chores for her, stuff like that. But this was a woman he used to call mom. Because he was only seven. She was like an older sister, you could say. And they were on their way back. Um, and uh, they stayed about a month there. And, and the prophet later, he tells us so many things. He says, uh, when he got to Medina later, he said, oh, I stayed at this house with my mother. He goes, and I learned how to swim in the well of Bani Najjar. That's where I learned how to swim. It was a summer trip. I went with my mom, I learned how to swim. Sallallahu alayhi was. You, hold on, let me pause. If you compare this to what Christians have on the life of Isa, it's nothing. We have so much. Now it's sunnah to take a summer trip, teach a kid how to swim. <laughs> Follow a sunnah right there. What would Jesus do? I don't know. But I know what Muhammad did. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or is it that we just don't know who he is, therefore we act this way? 
He says, I learned how to uh, swim. And then he says, when I was a kid, I noticed something weird. The Yehud of Medina, they used to come in small groups and they would look at me. They would look at me. Because the Yehud had already had in their prophecy, a prophet is coming. And so when different signs about Muhammad وسلم, is spreading, when word is spreading this and that, they're keeping an eye out that he's supposed to come now. Who is he? So, Amina was about 20 years old and they were on their way back and she passed away on the way back. She passed away on the way back. I want you to understand that the prophet remembers this. He's seven years old. I'm thinking about my son who's eight right now. He just turned eight. He was seven, right? Low key, that's the only reason I know how old he is, but it's okay. I'm thinking about my son. And if you have a seven-year-old brother or a sister, and you think about the loss of a, the only other parent you have, that's heavy. He would remember that and he would cry. He would cry, it hurt. Listen, they say that the Prophet وسلم, he lost everyone that he loved. Are y'all ready for this? You gotta be ready for what I'm about to say. Because Allah wanted only the love of Allah in his heart. Listen to me about something. Everyone in this dunya, Amen. you've heard me say this, everyone in this dunya, they either leave you or you leave them. You can't get attached to dunya. You love people. See, some of us hear that and we build a wall to people. I can't, I'm not going to get attached to nobody now because I don't want to get hurt. So I'm just going to act hard around my dad. Do you love him? Yeah, he all right. No, love, love, love people fully but know truly that the love will only go on into the Akhirah. Abdurrahman, no, Mufti Abdullah. Mufti Abdurrahman, one of the brothers, he told me a story about when his brother died. Their brother passed away about a year and a half ago. Young, 22, 3. Maher, how old was he? You may know. Very young. And he said that um, there was this one brother from the community. He's kind of from the streets convert and when they were at the janazah that young man he said y'all ain't even ready he said jannah just got personal <laughs> he was at the janazah he said jannah just got personal like i got people there i'm trying to i got i got a people there i gotta get there now this isn't some some distant that jannah just got personal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he lost everyone. He, lo he buried every child except Fatima. Musiba after musiba after musiba after musiba. The heart, and I heard, I haven't lost anyone close. I haven't. But I heard Abdullah say this last week because he lost his brother. He said, when our brother died, our father asked us, do you feel something empty now? And we all said, yes. His father said, fill that with the love of Allah. That's it. Because nothing else can fill that. No person can come. No person can come and fill that. Now just fill it with Allah. That's all you can fill it with. So the idea, the idea is not to stop loving people. My man with the nice hoodie. Not to stop love, what's your name? Ahmed, Ali, Ahmed, okay. Don't stop loving people. That's what we do when we think about people leaving. You know what? I don't want to feel pain, so I'm going to put up a wall. La. The sunnah is love people. Give them your all. But I'm going to lose them, Sheikh. They're going to pass away. I know, it's going to hurt too. It's going to hurt. It's going to tear you apart. And when the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi was at the, standing next to Hamza, he wept like a baby. He cried, man. He cried and he cried and he cried because it hurt. But Jenna just got personal. <laughs> Jenna just got personal now. I'm trying to meet people over there. <laughs> Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now, 
father he never met. Mother passed away seven years old. Think about your little brother. Think about your little sister. It hurt. Ummi Amen now picks him up and takes him back because they're halfway. That's why he said, that was my mom. That was my mom. She brings him back. And one of the things that I write about in my second book is we all need secure bases. So attachment theory tells us that every human being looks for a secure base. And here's the deal. Just because he lost them doesn't mean there aren't other people that can fill that gap and be there for you, though. It doesn't fill their space, but they could be there for you. So Abdul Muttalib, he brought him close. He said, this is my boy. He sat him on his special cushion. He gave him his preference. He, he, he ate with him. He ate at his plate. He gave him close treatment. He brought him close. The Imam read in the Salah, Alam yajidika yatiman. Did we not find you as an orphan? With no one. And what does Allah say? Fa'awa. But we brought you in. Allah brings you in and takes care of you through people. See, we don't understand. Everyone's like, we think this journey to Allah is alone. Allah uses people to help you on the journey. He says, Fa'awa, did he not find you as an orphan and bring you in? But who brought him in? In like in the tangible material world? His grandfather. But Allah is saying, I brought you in. It's because we do God's work on earth. Do you feel me? We do Allah's work on earth. We're the ones. We're Khalifa. That's what we're supposed to do. It's beautiful. So he lost her at the age of seven. Calamity. Calamity. And what calamities do is they disconnect you from the dunya. It makes you realize how transitory the dunya is. After a death, everybody's more spiritual, yo. Look at Gaza. All of us, we just like became deeply spiritual, like. Overnight, brothers like Fajr, Isha, Tahajj, you know, because death, it's like, what is this dunya? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes people away. And specifically with the Anbiya, He took people away. There's two reasons. So that the heart can only connect to Allah and so that we could have a role model to follow when we lose people. How, how many people have, have buried five of their children. I, I, I have a close friend that eight months ago buried his, his child. He couldn't, ask, he couldn't explain. I'll tell you the story. Twelve years ago, he went to Morocco and adopted a boy. He already had three children. He brought Ilyas home. They named him Ilyas al-Islam. <laughs> We don't know his last name, so he's Al-Islam. The boy was, mashallah, Nabat and Hasana. He was a good wrestler. He loved Qira'a. Beautiful kid. He, that was his dad. Now, he, he, he didn't know anything but this family. Beautiful. I have videos of his Qira'a. It's amazing. Eight months ago, it was an evening night, probably like Sunday night. He says, Baba, I have a headache. Ilyas always was tough. He could take anything. So when he said that, they took him to the hospital. I kid you, 48 hours later, we prayed Janazah. The next day, his father, Sheikh Tam, he was sitting in the masjid giving a dars to the community. And he said, Wallahi, I am happy with Allah. But it hurts. That's it. That's what he said. And he repeated it until he stepped, started weeping. Weeping, weeping, weeping. But he said, Allah gave me this child to raise and to be in Jannah waiting for me. I don't know what life he would have lived. So the Prophet Sallallahu he lost his, his mother. But, but other people can come and give you support. And you could be that support for someone that just lost somebody. Like, like, I mean, you got to be there for your man. He looks like your friend because y'all got the same haircut. It's your brother, see? But that's a common haircut. Everybody got that. Now. So. <laughs> you could be there for him. A lot of us have parents that were deadbeat dads, man. He's never around. Older brother could be there for you. Older sister. 
a sister from the masjid. Abd, Abd, Abdul Muttalib brings him in. And yes, he doesn't know his father. Yes, he lost his mother. But now somebody else brought him in. It's like, I got you. We could do that for people. We can do that for people. So he used to lay down a special blanket for him in the shade of the Kaaba. And he would make sure that no one sat on it except the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he grew up in the care of his grandfather. And uh, when he reached the age of eight years old, his grandfather passes away. Grandfather passes away. If you were to write a story of a prophet, someone that's loved by Allah, how would your script go? If you were to write a story before hearing this, of someone that's Habibullah, how would it start? What would year two be? Five year, year six be, year seven be? <sighs> Different, right? This one closer? Can't hear me? No? So you want me to use two or you want me to switch? Okay. The, so the question is, I, I want you to think he's eight years old now and he's forced to face another loss. Now with that said, what temperament would you think this child develops as he grows? But let me share this. Sahaba say we never talked to him except he was smiling at us. And this is why I say, if anyone had any reason to be salty, he did. But despite that, he showed nothing but love to people. We're walking around with a lot better. Salty, angry. Bro, what's wrong? Oh, something happened, whatever. Mother. Grandfather now? At the age of eight, he loses uh, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And we can reflect on the loss there. I told you the reason behind that. The Prophet ﷺ is then brought in by Abu Talib. Abu Talib, we're going to get more of his story, of course. Abu Talib brings him in and cares for him. But there's, a, there's one problem. Abu Talib has a lot of children. So there's not that one-on-one -on -one like granddad was taking care of me. It's not that one-on-one -on -one like mama was taking care of me. I'm one of 10 now. I'm another mouth. I'm, yeah, they, they, they're looking after me, but... And there was another problem. He, uh, he wasn't wealthy. He wasn't wealthy. So from a young age, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he started to work for himself. One of the first jobs that he did, now I want to pause here and I want us to understand the context here. In order to prepare him for the job that's about to be given to him, there's training that has to happen before. Everything I'm going to discuss right now, I want you to look at it as training for this message that's about to come. What's one of the first things that he does? He's young, 12 years old. Now rhetorical. One of the first things he does, he's a shepherd. A shepherd. One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was, he was talking to the Sahaba. It's in Bukhari. He says, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَبِيًّا إِلَّا رَعَ الْغَنَمْ No prophet was sent except that they were a shepherd of sheep. You know one thing's crazy? If you look in the Christian tradition, they always talk about Jesus as a shepherd. We haven't really understood our Prophet son was a shepherd too. You'll see many depictions. Him with the, with the, sta the, the, the curved staff and the sheep around. You feel me? Rasulullah sallallahu he says, no prophet was sent except that he was a shepherd. And the Sahaba, they said, wa anta ya Rasulullah? He said, naam. Kuntu ar'aha ala qaratit li ahli Makkah. He said, I used to graze sheep for pennies for the people of Mecca. He's 12 years old, but he has an understanding that I want to be a burden on society. And this is a message for the Shabbat. How many of us are just, I ain't gonna say it, freeloading at home, bro? <laughs> bro, you like 16. You don't got a job yet? 
Really? Now, I blame the parents, too, because so many parents, they get to a state and they're like, I, do, I work so you don't got to work. Bruh. <laughs> what made you what are you are work? So would you want to you want to raise a Shazada? <laughs> you want to raise a prince? So that when wifey says, can you help? He goes, uh. A lot of a lot of wives is struggling with husbands because mother-in-laws didn't raise men. Yeah, that, that needed. It. <laughs> Stop pampering your son, man, please. You are not doing the world a favor by pampering your son or daughter. You are not doing the world a favor. I'm sorry. And now Ahmed ain't listening to me. <laughs> You are not doing the world a favor. I'm sorry. If you keep doing your son's laundry, that boy is going to grow up and never be able to do laundry or do any chore in his life. The prophet's son was 12 years old. And he's, and I'm going to sound old. I don't care no more. I sound old. I had a paper route at 12, yo. Paper route, house to house, throwing papers like you saw in the old movies. <laughs> paper route. We found ways, we found summer jobs, we found, we worked cause so that you understand the value of contributing back. But now, our sons and our daughters, we just protect them. Bus part all, part all, bus, just part all, bus. Just study, that's it, just study. Nah, a shughl, shughl makes you. I guarantee if you stand on your feet for seven hours at minimum wage, you'll realize what $15 is. You'll realize that $15, you, you're like, yo, that's $15, man. I worked for that. So the first step, but here's a question. This is not a rhetorical. I want feedback from this. Why did every prophet have to, part of the training camp of prophethood, be a shepherd? What do you learn as a shepherd? To keep the herd together, number one. Those sheep, they go every direction. They go every direction. One goes this way, one goes that way. But with love and muhabba, you got to keep them together. What else? Patience. You trying to guide this sheep to pastures and he going off on his own. And you got to run off and bring him back. Run off and bring him back. Run off and bring him back. Patience. What else? Reflection? Oh, beautiful. I never heard that one. Just being out in the creation, hours. What are you doing? <laughs> Watching the sheep graze and the creation of Allah is in front of you. That's beautiful. You know what else you get? Yeah. I was about to say that. Understanding of different people's nature. All those sheep are not the same. So your, your community as a prophet is not going to be all the same. There was something to be taught in this. And so if we learn anything from this, because for us right now, it's like, well, what do I get from this? What I get from this is the importance of work and what it inculcates in you as a person. And the way you can destroy someone's capacity to reach their, 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 their peak is to pamper them. You are not doing someone a favor by pampering. I'm sorry. Eight years old, do the laundry. Ten, maybe. Twelve, yo, you know how to work a, a, a washing machine. Is that too young, maybe? I don't know. Too young? Okay, I don't know. That, that's what I'm saying, man. I'm watching kids of Gaza go get water. And your son, you tell him to get in the car, go get groceries. He's like, how do I do that? I stuck for it a lot. I'm sorry. But what I'm learning from this early time is that the Prophet ﷺ was being prepared for a job to do. So he had to be, 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 be forced to do these things that built within him the qualities that's going to be later on needed. This is beautiful. And the reason I'm spending time on this is because there's a lot of young people who want to work and their parents keep saying, no, you, you can't work. It's like, I want to earn. I want to go to, I want a job. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a shepherd. And we need to bring that in, that we need to own that. That our prophet was a shepherd. 
We need to own that. We need to value that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, uh, he was also a businessman. He traveled with Abu Talib one time with Abu Talib to do business. And, and I spoke about this before. You know, you know who know people the best? Salesmen. Salesmen understand people. You walk in the room to buy a car, they already sized you up. Because they, they see so many people that they start to understand people. I ask you, what's the Prophet son's mission going to be? To take this message to different people, to understand people, to understand what, how to make someone recept, uh, re able to receive the mission, how to build rapport with people. So I'll give you an example. There's a man by the name of Rukana. Yes, right? Rukana is a wrestler. The Prophet Sallallahu is walking by, down the street. Rukana tries to turn the other direction because he knows this is later in life. He knows this man's going to talk to me about religion. But the Prophet has been a salesman before. He's been in business before. That means he's had to deal with a lot of people. By the way, one of the things our Shabab struggle the most with is social interaction. Do you know how many people I dealt with at, at uh, busting tables as a kid? Different temperaments, different types of people. So, 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 so he walks up, Rukana's trying to go the other way. Rasulullah says, say, Rukana. And he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to talk. He's like, no, nah, I don't want to talk. I want to wrestle you. <laughs> now salesmen will tell you, just get a yes. Just get the first yes. Every yes after that first one is, y'all in discord groups for this stuff, man. Y'all be signing up. <laughs> Y'all in Discord groups for this stuff, yo. This is Sunnah, man. Subhanallah. Dudes selling you how to sell stuff. They just sold you right there. But anyways, <laughs> how to be a millionaire. Yeah, he made a millionaire because of people like you, bro. <laughs> the Prophet some says, Rukana, I don't want to. I don't want to talk to you. Let's wrestle. Rukana's like, Yeah, all right, let's wrestle. Got the first yes. Got the first yes. He's like, if I beat you, will you take shahada? <laughs> He's like, yeah, of course. You're, you're a rookie. Like, I'm a black belt. You're literally a noob. It will literally take a miracle for you to beat me. Prophet slams him three times in a row. <laughs> Man gets up. <laughs> but he was a businessman. And with that, subhanAllah, he said the first business trip was to Syria. Which subhanAllah is amazing because the message isn't just for Meccan people. He's supposed to give this message to an international community. So by traveling to Syria, he's now interacting with people of different natures. He's learning people of different styles. Interacting with people, buying and selling. One of his business partners, uh, later in the, in, the, in the years later, after Fath Mecca, one of his business partners came up to him. This is a beautiful uh, story. I'm going to share this one. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, one of his business partners comes up to him. And he says, uh, do you remember me? And the Prophet so I said, he's like, yeah, I remember you. We did business together. We did business together. And then he says, this is the narration. It was, it was after uh, Tabuk, Hunayn, after Fatih Mecca. And his name is uh, Sa'ib bin Abi Sa'ib. He comes up and he says, D do you remember me? And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Ni'ma sharika Sa'ib. He goes, now nah, you are a good business partner. We did business together. You are a good business partner. La you daddy wa la you maddy. Like, and he said, uh, he said about the Prophet, he's like, you were good too. You never argued with me. Like we're in business together. You never argued with me. Oh, split this, this much, split this. He's like, you never argued with me. My point being is, number one, he, he was forced to be a shepherd, to deal with different people, patience. SubhanAllah. And then he was, he was brought into business so that you understand people, right? You understand people. And now what happens next is Harbul uh, Fijar. There's a war in Mecca. Harbul Fijar was a war that broke out. And the Prophet ﷺ was only 15 years old. He was too young to fight in the battle. But 
He said, I was the one in charge of picking up arrows. They would shoot arrows at each other. So when the other side's arrows fall, someone's have to pick them up and give them so we could shoot them back. He's like, that was my job. But what, that's preparing him for life to come. We know how many battles are going to come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making him go through all of these steps. And then at the end of that battle, at the end of that battle, he, uh, I think I got locked out. Uh, yeah. yeah. At the end of that battle, there was a hilf al fudul where everyone came together and they were like, we can't fight like this. This has to stop. And so everybody came together to be a part. So what happened, this is really heavy actually. So the, the, the Meccans, the Quraysh used to think they were better than a lot of people. And so there was a man who came to Mecca to do business and somebody stiffed him, a Meccan stiffed him. You know how to stiff someone? Okay. He didn't pay him his money. And so when he asked him for his money, he's just like, I don't know you, bro. Who are you? Right? <laughs> right? Some of y'all know what that's like, right? Stop for Allah, Ali. <laughs> Ali. Bro. It's only certain transactions where that goes down, bro. Stop for Allah. I have Jahiliya. You ain't supposed to have Jahiliya. So, so he goes around all of, all of Mecca. Who's going to help me? And everyone, because this person who didn't pay him was influential, everyone was like, we can't do anything. Finally, he goes on the top of the mountain and he screams down and he says these beautiful lines of poetry about honor and what they're supposed to represent. And finally, one person comes and he, and he stands up and he brings everyone together and he's like, we have to agree that we won't let any one person be oppressed in our community ever. And everyone came together and the Prophet said, I was there that day. I was there. And then he said, if that happened again, Islam, I'd do it again. Meaning in the days of Jahiliyyah to come together, different people to come together to uphold justice, regardless of religion or anything. He says, if I was called to that same, uh, hilf, that same treaty again, I'd do it again. But he was forced by Allah to see that. And then the next thing, the next powerful moment. See, before he's, the message comes, everyone has to testify to his trustworthiness and his uprightness. Now, I want to share something else before I go to this, me, this main moment. Let me go forward. Let's see. Oh, the, the next thing is the marriage. We're, we're not getting to the marriage yet. The marriage is, is beautiful. There's a lot of lessons, but we're not there yet. We got to get up to that. So listen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send this prophet. And this prophet is a, is a proof to the people. But before he sends this person, he wants them to testify about what they know about him. So y'all know the story. The Kaaba needed to be repaired. Everybody was shook. We can't break down the house of Allah. Finally, one person is like, man, we have good intentions. They, were, they had fear, like if anyone breaks the Kaaba, that person's gonna, something's gonna happen to them. So nobody wanted to break the Kaaba at first. So one person goes over, he's like, we doing this for Allah. He breaks it down, one rock. And he tries to tell everyone, join in. They're like, nah, just one night. We want to see if you wake up in the morning. <laughs> like, if you wake up in the morning, we'll get back to it. He wakes up in the morning fine. And so they start digging. They start tearing down the Kaaba and they're rebuilding it. And you know the story, but let's talk about the significance. They, they're building, they're building all the clans, very tribal mentality, like prestige and honor is everything. And finally, they, they, they finished building it. And as we know, they ran out of money that was halal, which even goes to show the mentality of having halal income when you're doing something righteous. SubhanAllah. So they, they had to shorten it, as we all know, which qadrullah, masha'Allah. Now everyone gets to go in the Kaaba if you could get there. So anyways... They get to the black stone and a war almost breaks out because everyone wants that honor of placing the black stone. What I'm trying to show, tell you is everyone knows this story, but we don't understand how it plays into the bigger picture, the minds of the people. So what happens is they're almost at the, at the verge of fighting, literal bloodshed. 
When finally someone with a cool head, they go, let's just, let's just, we can't have this happen. Look, let the, the next person that walks into the masjid, let's let that person decide. And in the moment, there were calm people, they said, that's a great idea, let's just do it. Because where we're at it now is just civil war amongst ourselves. And lo and behold, by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a young Muhammad walks through that door, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here's what's so important. They immediately, they immediately all respond. Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen. The trustworthy, the trustworthy, the trustworthy. Yo, Shabab, I know you're young, but you could build a name for you right now. A lot of us look at, oh, I'm young, I could wild out, I could do whatever. No. You could build a name for yourself right now. He walks in and everyone's like, Alameen, Radina, Radina. We're happy with him, we're happy with him. Now, now you have to understand that's etched in stone, that's etched in everyone's mind. Every time they come to that black stone, the solution was Al Amin, Al Sadiq, Al Amin, the truthful. I want to share something at this moment. The books of history tell us that the Prophet was protected when he was young from certain fitness. He says, first of all, I didn't have a lot of inclinations towards evil. He's like, there was one time there was a party, a walima, a party. And I, was, I had the sheep, right? And there was another shepherd. And I said, yo, can you watch my sheep? I'm, I want to go see what they're doing because he heard the music. It was lit. And the prophet was curious, like, you know, I've never seen, I, what's going on? So we asked another shepherd, yo, can you watch my sheep for a little bit? He goes, no problem. 10 sheep, 20, 30, so good. He says, I start to go, and he says, I just felt tired. I sat down, he says, I woke up, the sun woke me up the next morning. It's like, man, I missed it. He said the next day, because Arabs have these long weddings, you know, mashallah. <laughs> the next day it was still popping. He says, yo, can you watch my sheep? I didn't get to go. Last. I just want to see what they're doing. I started on my way there. I felt very tired. Look, some of us have been blessed with a childhood where Allah protected us from fitna. That's a blessing from Allah. You don't got to see the darkness to know what light is, y'all. Take some of our word for it who saw the darkness straight up. There are some of us who came from Jahiliya that will tell you, there's nothing in the club, bro. It's darkness. There's nothing in that lifestyle. It's darkness. But Shabbat, I just want to see it. I'm like, Allah protected you, bro. Allah protected you. Stay, stay pure. Protect that purity. Protect that, that purity that Allah gave you. That's valuable. Never lose that. Never lose that. So the Prophet ﷺ was protected from certain, he says, I never, I never got involved. You know, I, I look back at my life growing up, and even though I was in Jahiliya, I look back now, Allah protected me from so many things. So many things. And now when I look back, I get the plan. I was the dude that always flaked. Hey man, you know what I'm saying? Everybody like, yo, we going to such and such. I'll be like, all right, cool. It's eight o'clock. In my heart, Allah, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But some of us pretend to like it because we think there's some fulfillment there. I'm telling you, there's nothing but empty souls there. There's nothing but empty souls there. Nothing but emptiness. And the true fulfillment, I kid you not, and I'm telling you, you may, it may take years for you to get what I'm about to say, but the true fulfillment that you'll feel, the best fulfillment you're going to ever feel, is those moments of solitude with you and Allah. I'm telling you. It may take you 30 years before you get what I'm saying right now, but you may get what I'm saying already. You're going to search everywhere, and you're going to come back to this much and do a sajda and realize it was here all along. It was here the whole time. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he walks in the masjid and they're like, Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen. The reason that's important is because later when he says, 
that I'm bringing this message to you. You know who I am. They can't say, no, we, we don't know who you are. He goes, history has documented what you said about me. You trust me with everything. So that moment wasn't just a moment to, to happen and see that that moment was there as a, as a, as a mark in history that y'all already know who I am. At the age of 23, 24, I walk in the room and everyone, 23, 24 is fitna age. And at that age, you said, Al-Ameen, Al-Ameen. Rasulullah comes in, like, what's going on? They said, we have this issue, we need you to solve it. And that, 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 that clairvoyance, that divine inspiration in the moment, he says, oh, that's easy, don't worry. Everyone grab this sheet from the corner, one tribe each corner, put the black stone in the middle. Everyone carried it over to the, black, to the corner. They all carried it. And with his own hands, he places that corner, symbolic that I'm gonna restore Tawheed to this place. Symbolic of what's about to go down 20 years from now. I placed it before, I'm still placing it, 40 years, 20 years later. It's not without meaning, it's so symbolic. You saw me place it when I was 23, 24. Why do you have any, any doubt today? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is around the age of uh, 25. He's worked. He's had a job. He's shown his ability. Let's go forward. Bismillah. Yes. So he built a name for himself. Al-Amin al-Sadiq. And he had uh, done well in business because he was upright. A lot of society tells us you have to be cut corners for business to thrive and things like that. La. Rasulullah Sallallahu taught us something different. Khadija sees him, very wealthy woman, married twice before with about three children. She sees him and she asks her servant, Maysara, to go and accompany him. She hires him. Mudaraba, basically, here's the money, you go buy and sell it, we split the profits. She tells Maysara, watch him closely. I've heard things about him, I just want you to watch. So two narrations. One narration says she already had an inclination towards who he was. She just needed someone to watch him closely to make sure. So I'll share a narration with you, which is really beautiful. Some scholars don't like the narration. I think it's a beautiful narration, actually. Um, so one narration, it says that, uh, give me a second. So one narration says that uh, there was an Eid, like a festival in Mecca. Um, and uh, her cousin is already Waraka. And Waraka has been already like woke to the scripture prior. So she's already been hearing this stuff in her family, prophet, this, that, oneness of Allah. So there's a narration that one day there was an Eid, there was an Eid, a gathering where all of the uh, women of Quraysh got together for a festival. And there was one Jewish man that had come from Medina. And when he came from Medina, he came to this festival full of women, women there. And he, it's really cringe what he's about to do, I'm telling you already. So he comes over and there's a whole gathering of women and he, and he yells out. He says, oh women of Quraysh, whichever one of you can become the wife of the prophet, do it. And it's really vulgar for their culture. It's a very chaste culture. It's a very... And so they all start like, you know, throwing dirt at him. Get out of here. What are you talking about? Like, we don't even know who you are. But she had been hearing what Waraka was talking about. She hears this Yahud say something about a prophet is coming, whoever can marry him. And then the qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi everyone knows. So some say that when she hired him, she already was asking, May Sada, I need you to watch him closely because I already have an inclination to who this man is going to become. Remember when I told you before, when, when everyone walked past him as a baby, some people can't see your potential, but there's some people that can see your potential. 
And they believe in you before you believe in you. They believe in you before you believe in you. That's Khadija radiallahu anha. So Khadija sends him to go do business. They come back in Maysara. The first thing she does is ask Maysara, what was he like? And Maysara is just struck by this man. The way he carried himself, the way he did business, the way the profits from what they sold, the barakah that they saw. Some narrations say they saw, he saw signs. He saw, he saw different signs during this, this thing that told him this man is special. There's something really special. They say that Khadija mentioned that it's as if Maysara became the servant of Muhammad during this trip. Because of what he saw in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she comes back and uh, Nafisa is a friend. Friends always hook up the marriages, right? Right, Ali? So Nafisa, she tells the story. She says, Khalid Nafisa, Kanat Khadija to Bintu Khuwaylid Imra'atun Hazim. Khadija was a sharp woman, she was intelligent. That's why they say they think like she already knew. She saw the signs in him. Sharifa, she was honorable. And Allah wanted to bless her too. She was the, the center of Quraysh. The center of a necklace is the most beautiful part, right? So that's how the Arabs say something was the best part. She was the, the centerpiece of the Arab. Highest lineage. She was extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy. Everyone from the community shot their shot. They all tried. But she said, no, I'm good. I don't want to get married. فَأَرْسَلَتْ me. Nafisa goes, she sent me as a spy. That's her word, Desisa. She goes, she sent me as like a little spy, إِلَى Muhammad. When they came back from Syria. فَقُلْتُ I went up to Muhammad. I said, Ya Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا يَمْنَعُكَ أَن تَتَزَوَّجْ Why you ain't married yet? The word that every young person hates to hear. Right? Every young person hates to hear. Oh, man. Something funny happened earlier today, too. I'm not going to say it. It was hilarious. Say it? All right. So I was at a community this morning. Y'all might know where I was at, so it'll work. So I met a, a mom, and like, I was leaving Juma, and someone met me, right? They're like, oh, Jazakallah khair for the khutbah. And so the mom goes, make dua, my daughter gets married. And the daughter's sitting there like, like, what, what did she say? She said it so smooth and quiet that the daughter didn't really catch it. But I caught it. She was like, make dua, my daughter gets married. I was like, huh? And the daughter was like, huh? Right? Like, what did she just say? I was like, I don't even know. I just kept it moving. So it's so stressful. By the way, like, I, I want to say this. A lot of people don't like when you keep asking them why they're not married. People are trying to get married. It's not as easy as it looks. And every time you, the auntie comes up and say, Shadi Nehua, right? <laughs> Like, you didn't get married yet. It doesn't make me feel better. So there's so many young people that get extremely stressed out that every time you see them, you keep asking them, why didn't you get married yet? 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 As if they're not trying to actually get married. That's not fair, please. A lot of people struggle with that. Young men too, man. It's like, bro, I'm trying, man. Like, you know, so sometimes you have to have a, a bit of EQ and understand, like, so people are really trying out there. It's not really easy. And if you just keep reiterating that, that doesn't make it easier for people. So keep, that's very important to remember. So she says, Ma yamna uka Nafisa goes, why you ain't married yet? <laughs> ma bi yadi ma he says what every young man in this room would say. I don't have what it takes to get married right now. Ma bi yadi. I don't have in my hand what it, I need to get married. I don't have the means. And um, subhanAllah, you know what's so amazing? If you fast forward to the third year, fourth year of Hijrah, Ali radiallahu an walks into the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he sits down in the front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he can't talk. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, 
Alaka Haja, do you need something? But he can't talk. So he says, Alaka Haja, do you need something? He can't talk. He says it a third time. Then the Prophet looks at him, he goes, You want to propose to my daughter Fatima, don't you? He goes, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's amazing? Ali is known for courage, but in this moment, he couldn't talk. He couldn't talk. How am I going to, yo, yo, uncle, you know what I'm here for, bro. <laughs> like, you set up the whole thing. You know why I'm here. The Prophet them didn't force him to say it. He just, he, he and, and wallahu alam, when he was saying, alaka haja, do you need something? In my mind, I see him smiling. Wallahu alam. The books of Sirah don't tell us he was smiling, but in my mind, he was like, what you need? Why are you here, son? Why are you here? You want to marry Fatima, don't you? And he goes, yes. But then, here's amazing. You never forget where you came from. A lot of us, we, we, we become an uncle, you have a daughter, it's time to get married. You forget when you were grinding. You forget that you needed somebody to give you a chance. You needed somebody to go, you know what, you got potential, young man. You ain't a doctor yet, you ain't got a house yet, but you got potential. You got honor, you got class, you got this, you at the masjid, you did, whatever. So Rasul said, Ali says, the Prophet says, what do you have? Now, the crazy part was, a sister had come up to Ali and told him to go propose. The same way Nafisa is there, she's like, to Ali, go propose to Fa for Fatima. Ali goes, I'm broke, I don't have money. She goes, don't worry, he'll take care of you somehow. He goes, I can't, I don't have nothing. Finally, he comes, the Prophet said so him, goes, well, what do you have? I could hear him, he's like, I told y'all he's gonna ask me this. <laughs> I told y'all he's gonna ask me this. He goes, all I have is my horse and the armor I got from the last battle. The Prophet so said him, goes, hmm, this is amazing. He didn't go figure it out. He goes, hmm, okay, hold on. He goes, the horse you gotta keep. But the armor, why don't you go sell the armor? He's helping him. Can you imagine you go to an uncle, you're trying, you're grinding, you're doing what you can, you're on your dean, you're praying, and the uncle's like, what do you got going? He's like, <sighs> and he actually starts to help you economically plan. Well, maybe if you try this, you try this, you try this. And then after he sells the stuff, he goes, okay, that's enough. You can, let me ask her. And then the marriage went forward. But where did he, where was he 35 years prior? He didn't have anything. And somebody was at him saying, just go ask. Just go ask. So she says, um, he says, which means he was working hard, but he still did. He was still working hard, but he didn't have enough to get married. Qultu, she says, Nafisa, he's like, what? she goes, what if that was taken care of? Like, what if somebody took care of that for you? We'll do ita ila jamal wal mal, and you're called to beauty and wealth. Alatujib, would you accept? He goes, for men here. <laughs> he goes, who is it? <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why I'm saying, like, subhanAllah, what would Jesus do? What did Muhammad do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We have so many details on his life, bit by bit, bit by bit. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, men here. Alayhi salatu wa sallam, men here. قُلْتُ خَدِيَّةً قَالَ وَكَيْفَ لِي بِذَلِكَ He said, how can I? He says, ذَلِكَ Like, the word ذَلِكَ is like over there. He says, وَكَيْفَ لِي بِذَلِكَ I don't even know how to say this with adab because he's our, our, our uh, Habib Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this is a moment where he, he's just seeing the simplicity of himself. And the honor and wealth and the beauty and the status of this woman. But she sees the status and what the potential is within him. So she sees herself leveling up. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. 
He says, well, kefali bidalika. The Arabic is beautiful. Well, well, how can I get that? Well, kefali bidalika. So she says, قالت قلت نفيسة goes, عليا, I'll take care of you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. She goes, I'll take care of it. You just give me the yes, I'll take care of it. Allahu Akbar. This is, this is seerah, brothers and sisters. I'm, not, I'm reading the Arabic so you know I'm not adding nothing to it. Like, yo, Sheikh was adding a lot of masala, you know. He was adding a lot of spice to it. I'm reading the Arabic so everyone hears the words as I translate them. Qalat kultu alayya. She says, I said, alayya, I'll do it. I got it. Qala fa'ana af'alu. He says, I'll do it then. Qalat nafisa fa'dhahabtu. I went, but she, she knows I was already sent by Khadija. Fa'dhahabtu fa'akhbartu Khadija. I went, I told her. Fa'arsalat ilayhi. She sent someone to call him. Anitti li sa'ata kada wa kada. Okay, let's all meet at this one time. And she sent for his, her uncle to come and his uncles to come. Thumma in the Rasulullah, then the Prophet mentioned it to his uncles. And they all agreed and they were happy. So he goes with Abu Talib and Hamza. And they went to Amr bin Asad. And the uh, relative of Khadija. And they go and they do the Khatb al Kitab. And Abu Talib gives a khutbah about how great his son is. And then her uncle gives a khutbah how great he is. And then the, the marriage happens. And uh, you know what's, what's beautiful about this is number one, um, yeah, right here. It, it goes against all the stereotypes of our culture today. Everyone is looking for a Cinderella story. Perfect. Like, do I have to get real? Can I, can I keep it real, Jimmy? Like, just keep it real, right? Like, why is everyone looking for this, like, fairy tale marriage? Like, this perfect setup. Khadija was married twice already with three children. With three children, the Prophet ﷺ is going to go into this relationship with a responsibility of helping raise these children. And that's the elephant in the room. That everyone wants the perfect age. Perfect, it has to look like Bollywood. The Hollywood has to look like Bollywood. The marriage has to be perfect. But, but subhanAllah, this is so beautiful. So beautiful. So according to most of the, the um, uh, look there, so, and not only that, can I share something that a lot of us aren't ready for? To marry a woman of strength and, and accomplishment and not make that speak about any of your capacity and capability. Some of us would just be like, no, she's too accomplished for me. <laughs> Bruh, this is a unit that works together now. It's not you versus her. Who cares what people say? Yes, like what are people gonna say? What are they gonna say? Who cares about people? Shorto ya. Who cares about people? What I'm focusing on is: Are they good for each other? Is their deen good? And he saw someone who was more accomplished because of the she put in work. She was extremely intelligent. Well accomplished. But the Prophet ﷺ comes into that relationship and he's a, he assumes awama too. Awama means leadership. He, he jumps into the role of the head of the household and leads the family. She lets him lead the family. So it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful... Um, SubhanAllah, can we... Another thing? She was his employer. She was his employer, wealthier employer. But the prophet, there was a there was a secret that Allah had, and we're, we're going to talk about that in a minute. There was a beauty in that moment, 
And I just think all of us should reflect on this because we all look for these ideal situations that it has to be picture perfect. But what does that mean? Everyone that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi married except Aisha had been previously married before and some of them with children. And the responsibility of taking care of them and all that fell on his shoulders. It's beautiful. Beautiful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had many, all of his children except Ibrahim, all of his children were from Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had uh, uh, Zainab, Ruqayya, Ummi Kulthum, and Fatima. And then he had Abdullah, and Ibrahim was born from Maria. So all of his children uh, were from Khadija. And um, before I go forward, Khadija held an extremely beautiful part. Play. The connection, and I'm speaking to the fathers, to the husbands and, and the wives in the room. The connection between him and Khadija was so dynamic and so powerful, so beautiful. The support that they had for one another. They're, they're raising these children, they're a house full of children. The Prophet said, Allah promised Khadija a house in Jannah with no noise in it. <laughs> with no noise. Fatima was born the year of Nabuwa. That means when he was going up to the mountain, she was pregnant. Do you understand the support she had to be there for her husband who's on this spiritual journey? With all those other kids in the home too? Their relationship was powerful. There was support, amazing support. And when she passed away, when she passed away, it broke him. They say he didn't leave the home for two weeks. He didn't leave the home for two weeks. He wasn't indifferent. Now I'll just marry you again. No, it broke him. They came to him and they said, like, Ya Rasulullah, it seems like like this hurt you big. And he said, how can I feel empty? She, was, she took care of everything here. She was there for me. True love. And you know what's amazing? And I'm going to segue into this because the next topic I have is revelation. At the age of 40, about a year before that, 39, so many years into this marriage, 12, 13 years into the marriage, 14 years into the marriage, the Prophet Sallallahu starts to pull away from society. He starts to get fed up with the, with the society, like the shirk, the gambling, the prostitution, the, 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 the zulm. He starts to pull away, like, I, I, I need time by myself. Aisha tells us later that when he got close to Nabuwa, hubbiba ilayhi al he began to love solitude. He began to love solitude like he wanted more time alone. So he would go to Ghari Hira. Now, if you've taken a trip there, from Mecca, driving in a car, it takes 10 minutes. But walking, it, could take, it takes time. And then climbing up, like you can climb now. It takes time. And, and Khadija used to pack his food for that whole time that he would be away. And he would sit by himself. One of the things that we, we struggle with nowadays because we all are so connected on social media is we don't get time to solitude anymore, y'all. We don't get time alone. We're constantly checking, constantly, constantly refreshing, refresh, refresh, refresh over and over again. You close the phone, you open the phone and open the same app you just closed. And you're like, what is wrong with me? Those are the moments you realize, like, something's wrong with me. Like, this is, this ain't normal. End of the day, 11 o'clock at night, you're still scrolling. Day is over. There's nothing new. <laughs> nothing new. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not like, some, uh, like a Luddite, like against technology. But what we have to understand when it's, when it's changing who we are. 
He began to love solitude. And the reason why solitude is important is because it gives you time to process your, your own thoughts. Let me give an example. Let me give an example. You ever been in an elevator with a stranger just going up like three flights? How awkward is that? Man, that's like the most awkward, man. Like, even in Mecca, it's even worse in Mecca. It's like, like you're in the elevator. It could just be three flights. That, that time in the elevator, you're just like, <laughs> and the moment the person gets off, you're like, whoo, man, you know what's crazy? A lot of us feel that awkwardness when we're by ourselves. That's why you keep opening the phone. That's why you keep, you got to listen to a podcast. You got to listen to something. You can't take a walk for silence because you'll be alone by yourself. And a lot of us feel like we're in an elevator. We get anxious when we're by ourselves. I'm scared of the thoughts that I might hear when I'm by myself. So what? I'm going to just stay plugged in constantly. The Prophet Sallallahu began to love solitude. A lot of us need more time in solid. Like, I hate to sound like some boomer, man, but like, do you remember when like you just had in between moments? Like when you were standing in line in a grocery store, what did we used to do? Nothing. You just were in line. Or a bank. Like, there's so many times when... I sound so, so old, bro. Like, right? But I remember the age when there were just moments where you were there with your own thoughts. What I wouldn't give to have that back for a little bit. What I wouldn't give. And that's what, inshallah, the masjid should be for you. Leave your phone in the car. Just when you come to the masjid, just leave it in the car. And for the time you're here, be comfortable by yourself. And if you see somebody sitting by themselves, let them chill for a little bit until they look at you like, oh, it looks like you bored. You want to talk? Like, no, I came here for myself. Let people be by themselves in the masjid. Time? What you mean? Isha time. All right, bismillah. The Prophet ﷺ began to love solitude. Let us, let us find that connection with solitude as ourselves as well time by yourself, especially at the end of the day. Set a time for when you're done with social media completely. And from that moment on, just have at least five minutes where you're able to reflect on the day and your relationship with Allah. Just five minutes, that's it. And watch the power and impact of that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to pull away from society. A lot of people, when they first make that change, and, and, and when I say convert, I even mean those who were born as Muslims, but they had an awakening in college or after college or whatever, you get tired of society. You see it for what it is. So he wanted time alone. And I want to highlight Khadija's support of that too. Support and she's pregnant, subhanAllah. That's mind blowing, mind blowing. And I guess we could pick up from here after. Should we leave this for after? What's after, Isha? Q&A only? I'm going to get into this then, okay. Munir, Tayyab, Bismillah. Um, the beginning of Revelation. Let's reflect on it. Let's talk about it. The Prophet ﷺ is sitting. Um, he used to start seeing signs. He, he started to see six months before. He used to hear salams, like salam alaikum, coming from weird places when no one was around. He began to see light. He began to see different things. And he would come to Khadija that I'm worried something's happening to me. What you have to understand is Allah is preparing him for this amazing event of communication with the divine. This source of infinite creation. You look at the cosmos, like I'm looking at the screensaver in the back there of the universe, and the creator of all of that is about to communicate with the finite. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. The creator of time and space communicating to this finite. So there were things that were strange. He's hearing salam. He's, he's seeing things to prepare him for this major moment. And that moment comes, and Gabriel comes, as we know, and he comes, and he hugs him three times, and he says iqra after each time. And when he hugs him, why did he hug him? There's a few opinions. One opinion was, you know how in movies they say, pinch me, like, is this real? Some say it was like that, like, this is real, this is happening, you're not dreaming. And so I want you to feel the actual, that like, this is real. 
Some say it was an indication to three levels of struggle he would go through in his life, right? Nonetheless, each time Gabriel hugged him, he said, I felt like I was going to reach my furthest extent, that it would kill me, and he would let me go, and he would say, Iqra. And I would say, I can't read, I can't read, I can't read. And on that final squeeze, he let go of him, and the beginning of the Quran began. The first moments of this final revelation that we listen to in every prayer that people memorize for the last 1400 years that's ingrained on the hearts the first moment and what does it begin with read they say that gave birth to literacy do you know they say Gaza has a 99 percent literacy rate our ummah we we pioneered education that's a separate whole lecture Iqra began this phenomenon with learning and reading the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't know what just happened it's a communication with the infinite creation of all you know when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came back from Misra and Mi'raj uh, they went to Abu Bakr and they said your, 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 your friend just said he went to the heavens and came back in Jerusalem in one night Abu Bakr said guess what I believe something even crazier they said what he said I believe God talks to him I believe that the infinite, the creator of the heavens and earth, speaks to him the way he spoke to Moses and Jesus and Abraham and everyone else. What's traveling from here to Jerusalem in a night? What was that? That has begun. Revelation began in this moment. From this moment, the Sahaba are getting it hot. Hot. You know, we say it's fire, new track. They're getting it hot, like as it comes down. He runs down the mountain and he runs back to Khadijah and he's shaking and you know the story but I need you to look at it from a different perspective he runs they say when animals are scared they seek protection in places when people are scared we run to other people he ran to Khadijah he didn't run in his office and say honey I'll figure this out give me some time he ran to her arms and look what he said I'm scared. Vulnerability. Vulnerability with wifey. I'm worried. Some of us walk in the house like, I got it figured out. Don't worry. <laughs> well, don't worry. I got it. I'll figure it out. Bro, relax, bro. Your manhood is not threatened if you don't have everything planned. It's okay to not know what's going to happen over the next 10 years. That's okay. What makes you a man is that you trust Allah. And when your wife sees that you trust Allah no matter what, then she'll follow your lead. But when you try to fake, like, oh, I got it figured out. Bro, no, you don't. Everyone knows you don't. I'm just keeping a hundred, man. Sorry. My time's running out. So. so so he ran to her and he's like, I'm scared. I'm scared. She, it's subhanAllah. Have you ever had, has anyone in this room had a mother that would hype you up when you felt down and tell you like no you got this in this moment she literally looks at him and she says Kella. he says I'm worried for myself I'm worried I, I'm going crazy or something's gonna happen to me she says Kella. no strong strong woman Allah Allah will never let you down oh don't you need that sometimes? Don't you need a husband that will say that to you? Don't you need a, a mother, a brother, a friend that will tell you, no, you got this. You know my Karima, she's my middle, she's the middle child. She's the best hype man in the world, bro. <laughs> she's like, Baba, you got this. I'm telling you, she hypes up her little brother. You could do it. I'm like, man, get you a hype man like Karima, man. And then when we try to hype her up, she's like, I can't do it. Like, it's really funny. But, but we need people that are there. And so Khadija in that moment, forgive me for time, Khadija, when we go to Q&A, maybe we can still talk about this. Khadija, she's there in that moment and she's like, no, no, Allah won't forsake you. And then she starts reminding him about who he is. You do this good, you do that good, you do this good, you do that good. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right, you're right. So she holds him. And here's the amazing part. He comes and she's, he says, hold me. Zammiluni, the song, we all know the song, right? She says, hold me, hold me. It's amazing, the scholars say, she didn't immediately say, what happened, what happened, what happened? 
She held him. And then when he calmed down, he said, she said, tell me what happened. Hikmah. There's brothers here for Salah. It's time for Salah. Uh, we should honor their time, inshallah ta'ala. So we'll stop right now. Immediately after the prayer, we'll open for Q&A, inshallah. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Sheikh Abdul Wahab, Mufti Abdul Wahab will be here with you guys. Uh, he's, he's a G, mashallah, man. Uh, he's beautiful, beautiful. And uh, his ability to connect to the seat is profound. So be here for him, inshallah. Uh, but we'll do Q&A right after Salah, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. So we'll open up the Q&A if there are any questions, inshallah ta'ala. Um, yeah, inshallah. Okay. But raise your hand, inshallah, and I'll, I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, those that are watching from home, inshallah, you'll, if you type it into the chat box, we'll be able to uh, ask your question, inshallah. So go ahead and uh, raise your hand, and I'll come to you. Bismillah. Someone break the ice. Uh, it's the first one is hard. Mashallah. Amen. Mashallah. Tabarakallah. Salaam alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum salam. How's your heart? Representing Dallas. My heart, after talking about Sira for three hours, it feels good. It's amazing, refreshed. Alhamdulillah, it's the best way to spend time, mashallah. In, in your current state, what part of the Sira do you reflect on the most at this point in life? At this point in life, what part of the Sira do I reflect on the most? I think lately, just having uh, younger children, um, just having children in general, I think I've, I've gotten more appreciation for the Prophet Sallallahu relationship with his daughters, right? How he was with Fatima radiallahu anha, that closeness. Lately, that's been something that's really been hitting me more as I watch my children get older. Um, as, as a husband, I've been appreciating more the relationship, the friendship that existed between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, his, uh, and his, his wives. Like the, the friendship there was so pure, it was so genuine, it was so amazing. So I think these are aspects that lately have been uh, hitting me more, more powerful. Next question from sister side maybe. Assalamu alaikum brother. Thank you for a great session. I have a question regarding the three daughters that were there prior to the uh, marriage, Khatija's three daughters. Were they Umm Kulsum, um, Rukhaya, and, or were they, because I've heard yeah. and read that. Yeah, so she had, so from her first husband, she had Abdullah and a daughter by the name of Hind. Uh, so that's two. From her second husband, and this is where it gets interesting, she had a son named Hind. So you have a daughter and a son with the exact same name, like Noor, right? Um, and also she had um, Hala, Hind and Hala. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for teaching us. Yeah. When did our beloved Prophet Muhammad got his prophet's uh, sign on his back? What age is Oh, that? yeah. Some say that the seal of prophethood came right when the uh, splitting of the chest happened. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's the stronger opinion. Oh, okay. Thank you. And many Sahaba, they, Salman Farsi was one of the Sahaba who he had converted from Christianity, so he had learned the signs of the final prophet. And so when he went to find, to make sure if he was the prophet وسلم, he did three different things. And one of the things that he did was um, he tried to sneak behind him to look and the prophet saw what he was doing. So he lowered his, his shirt so that he could see it clearly. Yeah. Oh, she's going to help sign? me. She's going to help me. Oh, amazing. Oh, she's going to, okay. Yeah. Brothers. About, yeah, okay. go ahead. I can repeat it if you just. Oh, okay. I'll bring it just in case. Just so those at home can hear. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Um, so you mentioned uh, the importance of having the seerah at home um, uh, yes. and making sure that's a part of our life. Yes. So on top of just recommendations on how to make that happen, but what are some books that we could take to increase our love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi more than just our knowledge? So just yeah. book recommendations. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, this was something we talked about in the beginning. In the beginning of the session, we said that yearly you should finish the seerah once. 
right? Yearly, you should finish it one time. And I said then, we could talk about books later, so good catch there. So first of all, I'm gonna highlight a few podcasts. Okay, a few podcasts. So the Qalam podcast, Shake Up the Nasser Agenda, has one of the most in-depth sirahs you could go through. Uh, hundreds of videos, I think 200 and something. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. So the Qalam podcast, if you go on podcast or Spotify, to Qalam podcast, you scroll around, look around, you'll see the Sira podcast, highly recommend. Um, right now there's a, a, a class going on right now called In His Footsteps, which kind of is Sira, okay? Uh, I think myself, inshallah. Some scrub is teaching, I don't know. <laughs> uh, then you have, of course, Yasser Qadi's Tafsira is amazing, absolutely phenomenal, you can't, it's one of the best. When it comes to books, um, that's where it gets a little, little, little interesting. So you have Revelation, which is good, uh, decent, right? It's pretty good. You have Martin Ling's Muhammad, which was one of my favorite, but some people don't like it because it has classical English. Like, so it's, a lot of people are like, what am I reading, right? Uh, some people don't like that. Sealed Nectar is good, but sometimes it, people don't know how to connect to it as much. Uh, but Sealed Nectar is a classic, Rahikum Maktum is amazing. Um, what, what else, what else? Uh, so, oh, Yasser Qadi's whole Tafsira podcast was put into a book, right, which is pretty good, really good, right? So there's five options right there. Um, wait, you want my book? No, those aren't Sira related. It's about the Prophet Sallallahu but. Sira to Mustafa is a great book. Um, it, yeah. <laughs> No, it, it's good, but sometimes an American Western audience can't really appreciate it because the style of the author. So he's like taking shots at Western colonialism all the time, and you kind of read it for Sita, but all of a sudden you're talking about something else. But it's, a, it's brilliant, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. No shade on the author, it's just sometimes a Western audience has trouble connecting to that. Yeah. We really, look, listen, I'm gonna say this. Um, we. We really need, this is an area I think more people could work on. Like we really need more uh, readable like Sira books. There's some books that I'm reading with my children that are Sira books that I couldn't mention that like paint such a deeper picture, right? And it's written novel form. So like a lot of us are used to like novel form. Um, I, I don't know the names of them. I just found different kids books and we're reading them at home. But the way the author paints the picture is just like a novel and it's right in front of you. And so I don't know a lot of those off the top of my head, but a lot of the children's Sira books are really good. Really good. Fatima, Sheikha Fatima in UK, I forget her last name. She has a book just on Khadija's life, written in novel style. Uh, so it's really nice, really nice. Um, so I gave two podcasts and like three books. Yes. No, I, I'm not familiar with that. the prophetic narrative. I'm gonna check that out. It's really good. It's a two volume book. So there's a book that I use a lot. It's just hard to find. Sheikha Samira Zayada. Oh, oh yeah. I'm, that's what I taught from today, in in Arabic. I didn't know the English name. I forgot. So Sheikha Samira Zayada, Rahimahullah from Surya, Damashq, uh, she wrote a brilliant Sira book. And it was translated by Dr. Tamara Gray and a few other women. Um, it was out of print forever. Uh, I got a copy before the last print went out of stock. And then whenever I would tell someone about it, it was out of print. But I think it's in print now. The prophetic narrative, it's brilliant. That's literally what I taught from today. So she wrote it in Arabic, and then later people translated it. Yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. Yes. I read in one of the, of the slides that the chest of the Prophet ﷺ was incised four times. Did I get to try it or it is? Sahih. 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 No. Arba Is this something? Sahih. Agree upon. Yeah, yeah. Those are pretty muttafaq It's not, it's not shad. It's, it's muttafaq alay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Um, 
I've read online that uh, you were inspired by the works of Malcolm X, right? Yeah. And um, I just wanted to ask specifically, like, what in specific did you read um, or, like, read his works? Like, what in specific was it that led you to be so inspired by him? Yeah, so the, one of the things that led to me converting, number one, was someone uh, introduced the Quran to me. And so I just started reading it in English. And when I was reading it in English, I was like, man, this... I know this book already. It felt so familiar, you know, because I had come from Christianity. I understood it. So there was a clear clarity to it. But the problem was at that time, the, like the people around me were heavy in like the nation of Islam. You know what that is? All right, cool. So, so I was getting all confused, like, you know, what's what? And I remembered that Malcolm X had been through a similar journey. So I started reading his book. But what really spoke to me is like he was in a jahiliyyah that... I could relate and the and the, the reform and just what it was just his inspiration bro he's an inspiration I call him Owalu a Shahid al Amriki <laughs> he's the first American Shahid yo I'm, there may be others but I, you know in modern times uh, uh, Malcolm X man Malcolm X I'm still a Muslim that's his line he came back from thing and he had uh, you know cut off from the nation and he was giving a press talk and he's like, I'm still a Muslim. You know, and that, that's an iconic line. He's just, he's just a men of men too, y'all. You see him by the window with the AK? No, you never seen that picture? It's powerful, y'all. He's just a, such a powerful individual. You know what I mean? And how before the end of his life, he realized like, you could see that he knew he was about to die. A lot of awliya of Allah are like that. They know when the end is coming. So, so everything, the way it was set up, like, he knew the end was coming. And he was at peace with Allah. I just, subhanAllah, the number of people that have been inspired by his life. Sometimes I wonder, you know, they say to say if it's from shaitan, but sometimes I wonder, what if he had lived longer? Like, what, what it would it have been like, you know? But, great question, man. Inshallah. Inshallah. I know a guy that was like 13 years old when it happened, living in Harlem, and he said, an hour before the shooting, we noticed so many cops on the street. He's like, he's like we knew some, something's weird, like why are there so many police? He was like, an hour before the shooting, I was already on my roof because I was looking, he's 13 years old living in Harlem. He was like, I was already on my roof of an apartment complex because there were so many police. So he was saying this later, he's like 50, 60 years old. In hindsight, he was like, it was a setup. They already knew what they, what they were gonna do. He was like, I was the kid. I saw the police cars already there ready. An hour before he was shot. It's crazy. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, this is in relation to an earlier question, um, but uh, you mentioned that Khadija had a few children before marrying Prophet Sallallahu So what was the story of those children during the revelation? They became, they became Muslim. Yeah. Yep, they became Muslim too. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know what I noticed about Sira while we're waiting for the next question? What I notice is every time you read it, your level of memory of it increases. So like the first time you read it, names will go past you, right? Like <laughs> Abu this, Ibn that, you like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There, there's one story, uh, the 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 uh, Mauna. Bitrul Mauna was an incident where 70 of the Muslims were sabot like attacked. In that story, three people share the same name, Amr. Right? It's very confusing. But every time, like every time, you're getting more of the names, more of the names, who this person is, who that person is. And then when you start to realize the family relationships, the dynamic is so different. The di so Zainab, for example, is married to Aas, who's fighting in Badr against the Muslims. Zainab, the daughter of the Prophet right? Like, so when you get these level, now you're pulling gems from the seerah that you're just like, wow, what was going on there, you know? So, yes. Native tongue. 
So which translation did you read and which would you recommend oh, amongst oh, others back, that, that, that Westerners can relate yeah. to as you say? So back when I was 18, like I just walked into Barnes and Noble and picked up whatever the Quran I found. Uh, I really don't know which one it was. Uh, but nowadays there's so many. SubhanAllah. I like the gracious Quran. I think Abdul, so that's one. I think Abdul Halim's is a, is a, a thing. Like you can't sleep on Abdul Halim's Quran. If I was to give a non-Muslim a Quran though, I'm going to give him clear. Mustafa Khatib. A clear Quran is clear. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Like they don't need commentaries, this, that. Just clear Quran is so smooth. But I highly recommend, like, there's so many Muslims, like, who haven't read the whole Quran in, 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 a, in a, their native tongue with fahm, with fahm and understanding. So I highly encourage you to, to make that part of your spiritual kind of, like, journey. Yeah. And one thing that we do when we read Quran, a lot of people try to become, like, scholars when they read in the Quran. Like, listen, the verses of rulings... You learn those from ulama and scholars to teach you the meaning of it. But to dabur and connection, like a lot of the, what we should be focusing on are those spiritual verses and that understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is built on. I think a lot of people just like start focusing so cerebral on rulings and stuff like that. It's like connect to the deeper meaning and you know. The whole beginning of today's talk, we talked about how the, you know, juz amma, was what built that foundation, right? SubhanAllah. Just read from Tabarak to the end in English. Surah Mulk to the end in English. That's it. Crazy. <laughs> I'll have you in a different world, yo. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. Okay. Assalamualaikum. I just wanted to add a uh, book recommendation for the Sirah. It's called When the Moon Split. And it's really nice because at yeah, the end of each that. chapter, there's like comprehension questions because yeah. like you said, there's a lot of names and there's a lot of information and it just, it's a good fact check. Yeah, I've, I've saw the first one, it's a really good book. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. When the Moon Split, it's a good reminder. You got that one, Habibis? There was brother. When the Moon Split is another. Rayan, Rayan, my guy. You got six books, mashallah. Just read one though, mashallah. Just <laughs> read one, get through one, bro. get through one. A lot of us buy books and think like, hey, that's it, we did our job. You know what I mean? We buy the book. I bought it, yo. No, read, read, I mean, read. Iqra. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, I'll be out. Um, just a request, is there a way that we could have a list of all the books that you just mentioned? Send in an email? Yeah, sure, okay. sure. Is there a, a Munir? Because I'm not going to remember any of them. But I'd like to, is there a way that we We got it. That's a great one. May Allah give you the reward for everyone that sees it. I mean. She just got the easy reward there too. She was like, please send it. <laughs> Mashallah. Um, there was one more question. Yes. One more book recommendation. Uh, let's go. Who doesn't Sul like? Sultan of Hearts is translated from a Turkish. Oh. Uh, it's really, actually really easy to read. Uh, it doesn't have the old English. Sultan of Hearts? Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's a large one, but um, it's really, really easy to read and brings uh, a lot of love for the Prophet um, and more of his character out in the book. MashaAllah. Barakallah feek. Barakallah feek. Um, any other questions? All right, we'll call it. Okay. No, sorry. It's just been a long day. Um, I had a question. Do you have any recommendations on how we can embody and cultivate the prophetic sunnah in our masajid so more people can like be exposed to the sunnah and start to love our prophet? Oh, that's such a hard question. Look, I think the more we talk about something as a community, the more awareness we build towards it, right? So like this program is special because it, we're all leaving here like dialed into sunnah, right? So like on a periodic level, every two weeks, every three weeks, like these type of something Sira related could be so instrumental in helping that. See, there's events and then there's programs. You know what I mean? Like this is an event, but we need Sira programs. Something that's like regular, right? Events are good because they, they like encourage us. Look at us, we're hyped, right? But programming is what like keeps us going. You know what I mean? Programming is so... See it are related programs, meaning not one-offs, but regular programs. And the, and the thing is, 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and maybe the book club. I heard you guys got a book club, right? So, so there you go. Even brothers, brothers, start a book club. I mean, and they laugh and see. <laughs> start a book club, man. Yeah. So Imam Bukhari, Imam Bukhari was accused of drinking a special liquid to make his memory so good. Back in his time, the, 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 the Hadith scholars, they, their memory was everything. So they, would, they, they thought there was a potion that people would drink. Right? You know supplements, Andrew Huberman, I mean, Huberman got you drinking all types of supplements. So anyways, so the supplements, they thought people were taking supplements to have a good memory. So someone asked him, he said, Tul another fil kutub. Just keep reading. He, so he, he said, like, the method was just, I'm not doing anything special. I just keep reading it. 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 Now, if you're thinking just like factual data memory, I think there's a lot of methods for that. But like, the method I was saying was have a regular reading of the Quran that you do on loop. It, I'm not saying spend 30 minutes every night. I'm saying, 10 minutes a night before you go to sleep, you read another page, you read another page, you read another page. And when you cut them, you go back to the beginning. And five minutes a night. And that's your connection with Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before you know it, two years in, you're like, names are just like that, this connection. And maybe for variety, you could go through those, that list so that you see slight differences. You get what I'm trying to say? So you're not reading the same book? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Come on, folks. We want to Let me just say thank you to everyone for coming. Mashallah, this was a beautiful night. Your energy. Jazakallah khair to the brother. Ahmed Ali. Ali dipped on me? Oh, okay. That's the unmarried Ali. Wave your hand again, right? <laughs> Mashallah. Uh, Barakallah feek, uh, everyone. Jazakallah khair. May Allah accept from us. You know, there's a hadith, and I'll end with this. There's a hadith when people come together. Quran. When they come together to recite the Quran or talk about khair and talk about the sunnah, that the angels circle the gathering and they, 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 they stack on each other up to the heavens. And Allah asked them what they were doing. Uh, what were they doing? They say they were seeking your jannah. And, and, and the Prophet, uh, Allah says that, uh, have they seen my jannah? And it says, no. And he says, what would they be like if they saw it? And he said, the angels said they would be more eager to have it and ask you more. And the hadith goes forward about at the end, Allah says, be witness that I have forgiven everyone in the gathering. If we just got that, checkmate. I mean, alhamdulillah. Not to mention the enjoyment of the knowledge that we learned and inspiration. So may Allah accept, inshallah. All right, salam alaikum. Go ahead. Jazakum Allah khairan, folks.